من خودشون به خونهاشون میخوام من یه سوال دارم از خان از شما ببینم این برنامه چون من امروز یکی دو تا تلفن کار داشتم از ایست کوست که میخواستم ببینم ولی خب برنامه اونها از 11 شب شروع میشه وقت اونها به 2 و نصف شب بعضی هاشون فردا اصلا سر کار رن گفتن این برنامه ضبط میشه یا یعنی گفتم من نمیدونم بله بله کامل ریپورت میشه روی خود وبسایت همین در واقع اینترنشنال افیر خواهد بود به صورت فری میتونن نگاه کنن هر وقت خواستن ما این رو نگفتیم بله میفرمایید ما این رو نگفتیم به خاطر اینکه اگه میگفتیم دیگه کسی نمیومد پای برنامه لایو بشینه این اصلا همه ریپورت شده رو نگاه اوکی دکتر راد من اینها اونا که میخوان نگاه بکنن دسترسی به کیس ها دارن؟ کیس ها رو سوالاتون منظورتون هست؟ نه کیس ها بکنی که به خاطر به خاطر که بعض این کیس هایی که من نشون میدم مار کتاب منه و در حقیقت من اختیار کامل ندارم این مار شرکت تیمه مار جرمنیه افرادی که معمولا وقتی که ما زوم میکنیم اینجا در یو سیستی میگن که کسی نمیتونه دسترسی پیدا بکنه به این کیسا این جریانش چی میشه؟ خب این ازتون اجازه میگیریم اگر که چیز باشه قرار شد در واقع ریکورد شده روی سایت بمونه هر قسمتش رو شما اجازه دارید ما اون قسمت رو میذاریم هر کسی فکر کردید که پرمیژن میخواد با خودتون چک میکنیم اون قسمت رو میتونیم در واقع مونتاژ کنیم و حس کنیم هیچ هیچ نگرانی نداره کامل از اون بابت خودتون راحت بشید من فکر نمیکنم برای کنفرانس اصلا احتیاجی به این چیزا باشه برای که یو کن اولویز یو نو یوز ایت این یور کانفرنس ایت یور بوک اند یو هاف دی اتوریتی Dr. Jamshid, uh, Dr. Terani, before the book is out, uh, you should not uh, show your cases in any other uh, discipline. That's the reason. Oh, it's not people... out yet, huh? huh? It's not out yet? The book is it's not what? out? No, no, it's forthcoming. It's not out. It's forthcoming. So, I, I, if I knew ahead of time, I would not have used some of them. I used the other uh, images. So usually, uh, I don't think that everybody should have access to the cases during the Zooming in general. Because if they have access to the Zooming, they can you know, use it for other purposes without asking you and for any permission. So uh, it, it's up to you, Professor Murphy. We can uh, uh, change the plan for the, uh, I mean, upload, uploading the uh, recorded uh, content you, you talk to at your, your discretion. Yeah, you, you talk to your IT people and find mm -hmm. out if they can uh, do something that uh, not everybody has access to some of the cases that we are using. But, uh, Uh, so I have to think about it and I have to talk to the publisher and uh, I will let you know after the meeting that uh, I thought right. if anybody has access to the cases that we are using, it's a little bit different. Akshin, what do you think? Better to just be safe as uh, huh? it's better to be safe just to check with the publisher. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking to Dr. Karimi. And Dr. Karimi has helped me a lot to uh, contribute to a good number of the chapters in the book. And he is a, uh, a board certified radiologist. He is a lawyer and he agreed with me. So uh, I want to make sure that we, we are prepared for something in the future. If something happened, then I have expressed my view ahead of time. Well, okay. So we will uh, wait uh, to have your permission and to get any positive, I mean, feedback from you to uh, 
upload the content. I mean, your cases, your parts, I mean. Okay. Thank you. So we can start on time, uh, gentlemen. Hmm? Ladies. Thank you. And ladies. No, <laughs> I was talking with you, the professors, the speakers. Okay. Do you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, I am uh, Jamshi Tehranzade. Uh, sorry, sorry, Professor Tehranzade. Let me to introduce uh, the, the program to the audience uh, just for, for a few minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm so honored to welcome you uh, to this webinar entitled as uh, Multi Speciality Diagnostic Radiology Board Review. My name is Amir Reza Radmard. I am the Associate Professor of Radiology at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and have the honor to moderate this uh, program uh, for you from Tehran, from cold Tehran at the early morning here. This program uh, uh, has been organized by the Desk for International Cooperation between Iran and uh, North America affiliated uh, with uh, International Affairs of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, you know, although the pandemic crisis had negative impact on all of us and canceled all face-to-face -face, uh, scientific and educational meetings, it provided a unique opportunity for us to benefit from virtual education and uh, learn from uh, well-known international speakers. Uh, today, we have uh, so honored to have three outstanding speakers who are definitely the giants of Iranian radiologists in the U.S. with, uh, with, with exquisite knowledge and, uh, and reputation. Uh, to, to be honest, uh, having these three speakers in one session for me is something like dreams come true. I hope our audiences that most of them are young radiology residents can take this opportunity to learn from these three professors who have uh, more than four decades of experience in teaching and training of the radiology residents in the US. And this webinar will run by a uh, case presentation given by each speaker. Uh, we had planned to have interactive polling for this uh, webinar, but we changed the plan just to uh, save the time. So we don't have polling for this webinar uh, and each speaker may include his questions inside his slides and you can just see the choices and review different choices and possibilities in your mind and it, it could be a self-assessment for you. So please keep that in mind that we don't have uh, a polling for this uh, session. Um, I hope we, by this method, we have more time to have more cases shown by the speakers. So let's start with the first speaker. Uh, Professor Jamshi Tehranzadeh is definitely one of the giants of MSK radiology in the US. He's currently emeritus professor of radiology at University of California, Irvine, and chief radiologist at UMIH. He has many publications. He has received several teaching and scientific awards over the past 40 years. And I'm so pleased to add that he has been the examiner of the American Board of Radiology for more than 20 years that made him to receive the Lifetime Service Award by the American Board of Radiology in uh, 2015. So I have the pleasure to welcome Professor Tehran Zadeh. Professor Tehran Zadeh, good evening there in California. Good evening. Please. Thank you for inviting me. I am really honored to be here uh, among these uh, uh, pronounced uh, uh, speakers. Um, to, tonight, uh, uh, we are going to uh, first start with MSK, which is my specialty. And uh, um, I put a full screen here. Uh, I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, I show the first case. 
Our first case is a 42-year-old lady presenting with six-month history of progressive pain and gradual loss of range of motion in the shoulder. So these are the uh, sagittal and oblique coronal uh, images of the shoulder. These are espineco uh, images. And basically, this is the first slide. This is the second slide. Um, and we have a differential diagnosis. This is after uh, doing a <clears throat> gadolinium injection. These are T1 fat saturated sagittal and <clears throat> coronal images, which shows uh, you know, contrast enhancement at the region of the rotator cuff interval. So these are the choices. Is this rheumatoid arthritis? PVNS or pigmented villonodular synovitis, adhesive capsulitis, or septic arthritis. These are the choices. The correct answer is adhesive capsulitis. It can be caused by trauma, immobilization. It is common in diabetes, can be seen in hemiplegia. Even cervical disc disease, metabolic diseases such as thyroid, high cholesterol, and even rheumatological conditions. The characteristics on the MRI is that the joint capsule is small. It is a shrunken capsule. You see thickening of the axillary pouch, scarring of the rotator cuff interval, thickening of the coracohumeral ligament and edema of the subcoracoid soft tissue and decreasing joint capacity and volume. <clears throat> Here on this sagittal, you can see that coracohumeral ligament is very thick. You can see fibrosis and scar tissue in the rotator cuff interval. The rotator cuff interval should have fat. There is no fat here because it's all a scar tissue. You can see a thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament or axillary pouch is very thickened. I just put a normal <clears throat> rotator cuff interval for you in this sagittal. So you can see there are a lot of fat in the rotator cuff interval and coracohumeral ligament is thin and compare it with the adhesive capsulitis where the coracohumeral ligament is much thicker. And you can see thickening of the glenohumeral ligament, inferior glenohumeral ligament due to a scar tissue. You can see a scar tissue around the joint capsule and you can see there is here more space and more uh, basically fluid uh, space between the subscapularis and the joint. You can see a normal arthrogram of the shoulder. The joint capsule comes to the periphery of the <clears throat> humeral head, but in the uh, very uh, short or small capsule of adhesive capsulitis, uh, your joint capsule is very small. And you can see that uh, this is, uh, the volume has decreased. Therefore, you can see that uh, in normal situation, the rotator cuff interval has fat. <clears throat> and in this case where there is adhesive capsulitis, there is a lot of scar tissue. Adhesive capsulitis causes tremendous pain and the patient is very uh, sensitive to very uh, small motions, becomes very painful. Rheumatoid arthritis was one of the differential diagnoses and 
Basically, rheumatoid arthritis can cause uh, narrowing of the joint and, uh, uh, and there is uh, uh, <clears throat> thinning of the joint because of the loss of cartilage and erosion of the humeral head and uh, there is granulation tissue and panus formation causing big erosions. The synovium is enlarged and there is synovitis and rice bodies in the joint, in rheumatoid arthritis. Panus is made of a uh, lot of inflammatory cells uh, and histiocytes which eats up the uh, bones and basically cause erosion. And rheumatoid arthritis is one of the common causes of rotator cuff atrophy and tear. Pigmented villonodular synovitis was another option for you and pigmented villonodular synovitis gives the same synovitis similar to rheumatoid arthritis. But in this situation, the inflammation and synovial proliferation has dark signal because hemosiderin deposit gives decrease signal or low signal or all MR sequences in pigmented villonodular synovitis. As you can see, there is dark signal in every sequence. And often pigmented villonodular synovitis shows uh, cystic changes uh, or erosions in both sides of the joint. In septic arthritis, which was another option you can see that, uh, first of all, because of inflammation and infection, you lose the fat side. On the CT, you can see the fat side is lost between the deltoid and the other muscles and the uh, infraspinatus and supraspinatus area. The fat is lost. And also, there is inflammation and edema of the, around the joint. And the, the, there are large... Uh, lymph nodes also in the axilla. Uh, and you can see even the bone has, is edematous because there is osteomyelitis and erosions of the bone as a result of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Something that staph aureus can destroy the joint in one week or 10 days can totally devastate the patient's joint. And you can see that the big erosions can happen in a very short period of time. Now we go to the second case. The second case is showing uh, in a 40 year old patient uh, with hip and knee pain. <clears throat> we can see cortical thickening and some calcification around the joint. And this on the CT, the same thing around the knee joint, you see cortical thickening and calcification. <clears throat> so these are the possibilities. What's the best choice? Is it osteopathia, striata, meloriostosis, tuberous sclerosis, or osteopoikilosis? The right answer is meloriostosis. Meloriostosis or flowing candle wax in the cortex cause cortical thickening, usually in the metaphysis, diaphysis, and also some soft tissue calcification. In occasions, it can even cause, because of calcifications, uh, ankylosis in the joint. So this is meloriostosis or candle wax disease, which is a non-hereditary diaphysial dysplasia. It's equally seen in between male and female. It begins in childhood and is the cause of uh, leg leg discrepancy. It mainly affects the long bones uh, of the upper and lower extremity and cortical hyperostosis resembles can, uh, flowing candle wax. 
And as I said, it can cause soft tissue calcification and even ankylosis of the joints. In the same broad spectrum of the same disease, uh, where you have basically a lot of cortical bone proliferation, you may have cortical bone inside the spongy bone in a form of striation, uh, which is called osteo osteopathia striata. So this is the example of osteopathia striata. And basically, uh, this, this you know, uh, is in the same spectrum as melorheostosis. But it's a different disease, of course, it's called Warhoff's disease. And it, patient could be asymptomatic, uh, but it, it can have some symptoms like cranial nerve the palsies and others because it can affect the skull and cause sclerosis in the skull. It's autosomal dominant and it is in the metaphysis and diaphysis. The patient's bone look like a zebra basically. And uh, uh, the, the other disease which was in the differential is osteopoichilosis where these a uh, compact bone in the spongy bones come in a form of bone island. And these bone islands typically go around the joint. So they are around the astabular joint, around the, uh, I mean, hip joint, the symphysis pubis, around the sacroiliac joints. And basically, you know, this patient look like a Dalmatian dog. And, uh, you know, the bones look like a Dalmatian dog which have these spots all over the, around the joints. So osteopoikilosis or Warhoff's disease. So basically this is an autosomal dominant, which the incident is one over 50,000, may have mild joint pain than effusion. Uh, it can affect epiphysis, metaphysis around the joint in the peripheral skeleton. The interesting thing is that it does not affect the spine Unlike the tuberous sclerosis, which the bone islands can affect the spine, this uh, osteopoikilosis does not affect only long bones of upper and lower extremity. Interestingly, although they have this compact bone, the bone scan is uh, normal in these patients. Uh, these patients could have a skin disease, cleft palate, dwarfism, spinal stenosis, even a scleroderma and syndactyly could be associated with this disease. So this is tuberous sclerosis is another option that we had in here, which give you the same kind of uh, bone island type sclerosis. And basically it can affect different bones, including the spine. This disease, this tuber, tu tuberous structures can involve different organs. It can be in the brain, it can be in the kidney, uh, even angiomyolipoma of the kidney could happen. It can happen in the, uh, in the brain, it can happen in the skin, uh, and uh, different organs such as kidneys can be involved. And basically the, in the bone, it causes sclerotic bone densities. So now we go to case number three. Patient with shoulder pain following an abduction external rotation injury. This is the X-ray, an external rotation view of a shoulder. The arrow is pointing to a little piece of bone here. And we have axial fat saturated image and a <clears throat> T1 weighted image, which shows basically the same thing with like a piece of bone here. And so what's the diagnosis? Is this a Bagel lesion or is it a Hegel lesion or is it synovial chondromatosis or loose body in the joint? What's the best choice? The answer, it's a bagel lesion. 
bony avulsion of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. In other words, as a result of abduction external rotation of the shoulder during the accident, the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which is attached to the humerus, is get pulled. And this during this avulsion injury, a piece of bone from the medial cortex of the humerus is evolved. And basically this is an avulsion fracture. And This is in contrast, if the bone does not get evolved, the inferior glenohumeral ligament uh, get evolved, you get Hegel lesion. So that was the, another differential. So Hegel is humeral evolution of your glenohumeral ligament from the humerus. It does not have the piece of bone. So we don't call it Hegel, we call it Hegel. Now, the other option was synovial chondromatosis. Now, why did I put that there? Because there was a piece of bone in the joint. Was it part of the synovial osteochondroma, which is basically synovial osteochondromatosis is a, a synovial disease, which in a form of primary is a metaplasia of synovium. And in the form of secondary is as a result of severe osteoarthritis and uh, sometimes loose bodies in the joint. In the form of primary, you have numerous, like this one, you have numerous um, synovial osteochondromas, uh, which are uh, almost the same size, and uh, they are uh, associated with expansion of the joint synovitis. They ultimately cause osteoarthritis in the joint and they may even cause erosion. They very rarely, I mean, uh, the, the chances of malignancy is very, very rare. But if they become malignant, they usually give uh, chondrosarcoma, which is, as I said, uh, synovial chondrosarcoma as a result of this is very, very rare. Now we go to case four. Okay, so with this case four, we have knee pain and we have two images of the knee. One is coronal and one is axial. You gotta remember that, of course, we always diagnose meniscal diseases on sagittal, but we should always look at the coronal and axial to diagnose meniscal changes. So this is a patient who has some meniscal changes. Now, what's the, this uh, condition? Is this a radial meniscal root tear? Is it a horizontal meniscal tear? Is the bucket handle tear? Or is it the Risper grip tear, which is a form of meniscal tear with ACL tear together. So it is the correct answer is a radial meniscal root tear. It's a radial tear, you can see it is a radial tear because it is cutting the, to the meniscus in a radial fashion and it is close to the root. As a result of anything which is close to the root or root of the meniscus, would release the meniscus and causes extrusion of the meniscus. As you can see, the meniscus is falling off, is extruded. And basically, this extrusion of the meniscus can happen in two conditions. It can be as a result of meniscal root tear, or it can be as a result of Oreo cookie sign, which we see in osteoarthritis. So in this case, we have meniscal root tear which is basically a radial tear in the meniscus. And it is not the other options. The other options were, um, I will discuss as I go through this. Now, this is a radial meniscus root tear, which basically occurs in the radius of the 
periphery of the meniscus. Sometimes, you know, in some literature, it says that 10% of arthroscopic examination are due to the uh, meniscal root tear, the meniscectomies. They can arise from a number of mechanisms, and they are generally thought to be chronic. Now, meniscal root tear, it can be associated with an avulsion uh, or tear uh, of the anterior cruciate ligament, which we call Risper grip. And I'll show you the example of Risper grip too. So here we have a radial tear. In this radial tear, this, is ra this radial tear actually is more in the anterior part of the meniscus. And you can see this radial tear here uh, in the corona. This is a horizontal tear. Horizontal tears, it's like cutting through the pita bread. And basically, these horizontal tears are often associated with meniscal cyst or, peri, or uh, perimeniscal cyst. Here is an example of horizontal tear with perimeniscal cyst. And basically, if you look at the arthroscopy, meniscal tear with perimeniscal cyst are usually go together. Now, very common tear is a bucket handle tear. Bucket handle tear are uh, relatively common. And basically what you see, there are several signs which you can see in bucket handle tear. Uh, you can see double posterior cruciate sign uh, or fragment in the notch sign or flipped meniscus sign, because a piece of the posterior horn of the meniscus would fall or, or flip over to the back of the anterior uh, meniscus and create a flip meniscus sign. It's like a piggyback of meniscus, basically. Flip. So these are all different signs which we use for bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Now, Risper grip is interesting because although it's not very common, but the mechanism is very interesting. <clears throat> As you know, Risper ligament is attached, which is a meniscofemoral ligament, this posterior meniscofemoral ligament is attached to the posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. And when you have a tear of the ACL, when the ACL, as a result of rotation of the knee, rips apart, it pulls the Risperg ligament from here. And as a result, it tears the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So you can see the tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, and you can see the ACL tear with it. So ACL tear is associated in this case with the uh, ripping of the meniscofemoral ligament and ripping of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which is called Risper grip sign. Now as a indirect sign, you always see a bone contusion, focal bone contusion in the lateral femoral condyle and posterior tibial plateau. These two signs, these two poor bone contusions, when you see together, it's a very good sign that the patient has ACL tear. Case number five. Okay, so we have a shoulder which in every view look like the humerus is in internal rotation. We tell the technician, go, go and take an external rotation. All of your views are showing internal rotation. Well, the technician goes and comes back with another internal rotation. He cannot take external rotation. The reason is the patient cannot do external rotation as a result of this problem. So what's the problem? 
Is it luxatio erecti? Is it inferior shoulder dislocation? Is it posterior shoulder dislocation? Is it anterior shoulder dislocation? The correct answer is posterior shoulder dislocation. In posterior shoulder dislocation, no matter what the technician does, he can never take an external rotation or neutral position. It's the humeral head is always gonna be in internal rotation fixed in that position. So what happens? Usually as a result of electric shock or epilepsy or some kind of severe uh, injuries, you may have posterior dislocation where the humeral head hits the, uh, the posterior aspect, the anterior medial aspect of the humeral head is the posterior aspect of the glenoid. So you have a trough or reverse bank cord here in the anterior medial humeral head, and you have a reverse bank cord on the glenoid. So if I show you the MRI on axial, you see the trough sign with the impaction fracture of the anterior medial humeral head and also osteochondral uh, bank cord, reverse bank cord, which is the posterior glenoid, because these two areas impacted during the posterior dislocation. <clears throat> So <clears throat> the other option was luxatio erecti. Now, in this dislocation, the patient comes to the emergency room with the arm elevated like this, as if he has a question. If he can reduce his dislocation, you answer this question. Luxatio erecti. You know, it's like an, a student raising his arm to ask a question. It's a form of inferior dislocation of the shoulder. The next option was anterior shoulder dislocation. So you can see that this is the most common, this 90 to 95% of the shoulder dislocations are anterior shoulder dislocation. As a result, you may get heel sacs fracture dif deformity in the uh, posterolateral aspect of the humeral head, or you get um, osteochondral uh, bank cord lesion in the anterior inferior glenoid. So anterior inferior glenoid bank cord lesion and posterolateral humerus, which they impact together, cause uh, heel sacs here bank cord here. So these are the results of anterior shoulder dislocation. <clears throat> Go to case number six. This is a 26 year old uh, boy, collegiate student, which uh, had bilateral growing pain or hip pain. And this is the X-ray and this is the shoulder, I mean, hip or MR orthogram. What's the diagnosis? You see a little bump here at the junction of the head and neck. Is this pincer deformity? Is this cam deformity? <clears throat> is this Myers dys dysplasia? Or is it coxa magna or leg vertis? It is cam deformity, of course, which is a form of the femoroastabular impingement uh, and causes basically problem uh, for the glenoid of, of for the astabular labrum 
causes labral cartilage damage and tear. And you can see often there is a little osastabulum because this is usually calcification of the torn labrum. And you may see a little bit of pit defect, uh, which is associated with this deformity. What is CAM? CAM shaft have the job of opening, it's in the engine of the car, basically. It's opening the valve of the exhaust into the, and it causes basically the flow of the, open up the valves in the engine. And the camshaft used to uh, rotating loops, which is called cam. So this portion of this is called cam, which opens the valve. And basically there is a spring which brings the valve back together uh, after it closes. So basically this mechanism is used in the car. And the reason the cam deformity is called cam deformity because it has this deformed shape of this structure. Now pincer deformity is when you have over coverage of the astabulum. And that also can cause femoral astabular impingement. So this is cam, this is pincer. Now, how do we measure the pincer deformity? We can measure this angle, which is called the lateral central angle, uh, lateral center angle. And we draw a line to the edge from the center of the femoral head to the edge of the astabulum, and another line perpendicular to the horizon. Uh, and basically, this angle should not be more than 39 degrees. If this angle is more than 39 or 40 degrees, then you have pincer deformity, which can cause femoral stabular impingement. So what is pincer? Pincer is, you know, something like that, which basically causes impingement of the astabular labral cartilage and causes erosion and tear of this cartilage. So this angle, uh, which is lateral central uh, edge angle um, should not be more than 39 degrees. In this case, it's 41.78 degrees, which is basically uh, abnormal. Anything which is more than 39 is abnormal. What are the causes of pincer deformity? Could be idiopathic, could be due to coxa profonda, could be uh, associated with osastabuli, protrusia astabuli, dysplasia of astabulum, chromatic deformity, iothrogenic as a result of overcorrection of the retroversion dysplasia of the hip. You know, so could be iothrogenic basically. So when you have this pincer deformity, you have overcoverage, which causes femoral stabular impingement. When you have cam, you have this bump on the femoral head. And sometimes <clears throat> a stabular retroversion creates a figure of eight in the edge of the stabulum. In other words, you can see the anterior wall of a stabulum extend more lateral to the posterior wall, and that creates a figure of eight, which is abnormal. So, and that can cause pincer deformity. In this case, you have figure of eight in both sides. So this patient has bilateral pincer deformity. A form of hip dysplasia, which is basically uh, seen in the children, is called Myers hip dysplasia. It's a normal variant, by the way. It usually is seen around age two, two years old, and by age six, it goes away because it's get corrected. What you see on the X-ray is basically a multi-fragmented uh, epiphysis of the femoral head on one side. Uh, you know, some people may think that it may be a hip dysplasia due to uh, congenital hip dysplasia, or it may be related to leg 
Calvi Pertis disease, but it is not. It's a normal variant. It's Myers dysplasia, it's a normal variant. Basically, if you have something like that, that is not normal. That is Lake Calvi Pertis disease, which is idiopathic ischemic necrosis of the epithesis of the femoral head, which is seen in the children. And basically, you know, it could be unilateral or bilateral. And basically, gradually, it would lead to coxa magna. Coxa magna means the head is larger. The head of the female is larger. And gradually, the head of the female would dislocate laterally and um, would result in osteoarthritis. In adult, it creates coxa magna with osteoarthritis. So, leg calvary pertis disease. Case number seven. Chronic shoulder pain. I'm showing you two oblique coronal steel imaging. Fluid sensitive images, both coronal. What are we seeing here? We see a lot of bright signal here, right? So what, what's going on? Is this Kaiser phenomenon? Is this perilabral cyst? Is it intramuscular ganglion cyst? Or is it soft tissue sarcoma? It is geyser phenomenon. You know, geysers are these things, many of these geysers in Yellowstone Park in the United States. And basically, you know, hot steam or hot water may come out of this like artesian well, you know, it comes out by itself and it creates a lot of smoke and steam. And basically, where do we see that? We see that when we have a full thickness or complete tear of the supraspinatus tendon. So in case of full thickness tear of supraspinatus tendon, the fluid comes out from the site of the tear, goes in the acromioclavicular joint, goes through the tear in the deltoid, and comes under the skin. So basically creates an appearance of a geyser. So geyser phenomenon is sign of full thickness tear, which we see in this sagittal view in this patient. Now, a differential diagnosis was perilabral cyst. Where, when do we see this perilabral cyst that indicates the patient has labral tear? So presence of the perilabral cyst is indicative of the perilabral tear. And basically, uh, it can press over this uh, suprascapular nerve and cause atrophy of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus. If it is occurring in the axillary nerve area, it can cause tres minor quadrilateral atrophy or tres minor atrophy. Another differential was intramuscular ganglion. These ganglions, which can be in the they are very common in the infraspinatus than supraspinatus, but these ganglions are usually as a result of tear in the muscle, intrasubstance tear in the muscle, which expands and creates this ganglion cyst. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it may come to a differential diagnosis with this cyst around the shoulder. And sometimes this tumors or sarcomas may look like cysts. And basically, uh, of course, in this case is a synovial cyst sarcoma. It's obvious it's a tumor, 
but some of these sarcomas, they may look like cysts on the P2 weighted images. You have to give contrast to make sure they are not tumor. Middle-aged lady, case number eight. Middle-aged lady with joint pain. This is a Norgard view. Norgard view is called praying hand view. So we take this, this is the best view for arthritis, Norgard view. In the United States, they call it all estate view. You are in good hand with all estate. Basically, <clears throat> in this view, you see a lot of calcifications in this patient, which is obvious and you have acrosteolysis. So what's a diagnosis? Is it renal osteodystrophy? Is it psoriatic arthritis? Is it scleroderma or gouty arthritis? The correct answer is scleroderma. It has bone resorption, acrosteolysis, the tufts are gone. Usually you have a mushroom bone on the tuft, but if you don't see that, it's sign of acrosteolysis. And they see a lot of calcifications. Now in psoriasis, you don't get these calcifications. You get, the, you get calcifications in the renal osteodystrophy. I'm gonna show you, but they usually the bone resorption in the, are in the radial aspect of the, of the phalanges. So this is a scleroderma with acrosteolysis and soft tissue calcification. The facies is typical. It's a multi-system autoimmune disease. It can involve MSK, lungs, cardiac, GI tract, hepatobiliary, kidneys. So it's a multi-system disease, three times more common in female, causes 72 100, almost 197% arthropathy. Common esophageal involvement, 80%, causes dilation and slow motility in the esophagus and in the bowel, pulmonary, 90%. So slow motility, dilation, esophagus, MSK changes, 70 to 97%. Across the lysis, erosions, calcification in the soft tissue. So this is a scleroderma. In the lung, it creates multiple uh, <clears throat> diffuse form of the interstitial disease. It could be looking like usual interstitial pneumonia, rheumatoid lung, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary arterial hypertension. It causes stack coin appearance, dilation, slow motion in the small bowel. And basically it creates dilated loop of the small bowel and very delayed transit time. The differential diagnosis was renal osteodystrophy where you get, which is secondary hyperparathyroidism, you get soft tissue tumoral calcinosis, calcification in the soft tissue subperiosteal resorption in the radial aspect of the phalanges, typical of this disease, secondary hyperparathyroidism. The other differential is psoriatic arthritis, which can give you um, mouse ear erosions, similar to the Mickey Mouse ear here, or Minnie Mouse in this case. You can see that erosions are look like these mouse ears, the typical periosteal new bones of the psoriasis, and they give you sausage fingers, sausage fingers. Sausage finger is re result of edema of the soft tissue, and tenosynovitis, which gives you sausage finger, and tenosynovitis in psoriatic arthritis, and it gives, okay. The next differential diagnosis is gouty arthritis, which is in the category of lumpy, bumpy arthritis. We have three diseases with lumpy, bumpy arthritis. One is gout, 
One is amyloidosis, the other one is multicentric reticular histiocytosis. Gout is the most common one. If you see lumpy bumpy arthritis, the most 99% is gout. The other ones are very rare. Amyloid is rare. Uh, multicentric reticular histiocytosis, even more rare than those. So usually give you all punched out erosions with overhanging edges. That is typical appearance of this lumpy bumpy arthritis. And it is gout. Gout is caused by sodium monounate, and it is usually first metarsophalangeal joint, joint involvement with podagra, other joints in the foot and in the hand. And basically that's it. Number nine. Number nine is a painful shoulder with progressive weakness. And um, you can see some increased signal in the, this steel imaging in the supraspinatus, in the infraspinatus. And basically, these are the differentials. What is the best differential? What is the correct diagnosis? Is this rotator cuff tear? Is it Parsonage Sterner syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, or supra infraspinatus tendonitis? The correct answer is Parsonage Sterner syndrome, which is basically showing increase signal in the supraspinatus here and infraspinatus here. It is a disease which causes painful shoulder with progressive weakness, non-specific symptom mimics other conditions. In two thirds of the cases is unilateral and <clears throat> EMG shows denervation of the suprascapular nerve. It can be caused by viral conditions such as herpes, or maybe it is bacterial or viral, we don't know. Sometimes other causes could cause Parsonage Turner. Uh, in 97% of the cases, suprascapular nerve in the shoulder is involved. And supraspinatus and infraspinatus, which are fed by this supraspinatus nerves are involved. Rarely, it can cause axillary nerve involvement and subscapularis nerve involvement. Rarely deltoid nerve involvement by axillary nerve involvement. Denervation changes would give you atrophy in the, or denervation changes in the muscle gives you bright signal, which is gives you atrophy or bright signal in the muscle or in look like inflammation in the muscle, but they are really the innervation of the muscle. And they are self-limited usually by 90% uh, of them by third end of the third year goes away. <clears throat> so the differential diagnosis for Parsonage Turner is Issues atrophy of shoulder, quadrilateral space syndrome, uh, entrapment syndrome of the shoulder, mass or perilabral cyst of the shoulder, and trauma. The differential diagnosis one was tendinosis. You know, when you see intermediate signal in the steel imaging or fat saturated imaging, that's tendinosis. Because if it was a tear, it would give you brighter signal. <clears throat> like a tear here, you can see very bright signal. This is complete rupture of the supraspinatus and retraction. This is a retracted portion of the supraspinatus here. This is a complete rupture of supraspinatus. And here you have rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis basically uh, is a condition which you can get as a result of several things. Most of the time is a result of strenuous activities in the muscles, uh, such as somebody who is a beginner and you know, basically does a lot of strenuous activities, causes rhabdomyolysis, that increases the keratin 
in the urine and causes increased signal in the muscle on the MRI. Basically, external rhabdomyolysis, exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. It can even be caused by infection, myositis. It can be caused as a result of infarction, such as impaction during car accident, or as a result of um, impaction syndrome, as a result of hemorrhaging to the muscle or fascia, which causes de de devascularization and infarction of the muscle. Even a snake bite can cause you rhabdomyolysis. The last case, which is case number 10, is a 37-year-old man with dysphagia. Here, we have a case where we have a little calcification on the CT of the cervical spine and then the anterior tubercle of atlas. And we have low density structure here, which is basically causing a little distance between the pharynx and larynx, the pharynx uh, here and the vertebra. So, so there is something uh, fluid like here and there is some calcification here. So what's the diagnosis? And again, you can see on the axial and on the sagittal, this calcification and this fluid. Is it rheumatoid arthritis? Is it CPPD or pseudogout? Is it calcific tendonitis of lumbus coli? Or is it odontoid bone fracture? <clears throat> it is calcific tendonitis and bursitis of lumbus coli. And that's where lumbus coli uh, tendon extends down and the fluid around the tendon cause bursitis. You can see the fluid around the tendon and causes bursitis. And basically calcification, the calcific tendonitis, this hydroxyapatite, it's similar to the calcific tendonitis in the shoulder, hydroxyapatite deposition disease. And basically the differential diagnosis here is CPPD, which is calcification in the transverse ligament, erosion of the odontoid tarsus as a result of CPPD or pseudogout, uh, and erosion of the end plates uh, in the disc, uh, in pseudogout. And basically another differential diagnosis is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, when you get uh, panus formation around the synovial sacs around the odontoid, which uh, cause tear of the transverse uh, ligament, which is very a strong ligament, but because of the panels, it tears and gives you atlanto axial subluxation. If you have more than three millimeter distance here, you have atlanto axial subluxation between the odontoid and anterior tubercle of atlas. So you see it based on flexion. And finally, your last differential was a fracture of the base of odontoid, which is seen here, is a type three odontoid. The first type is the tip, the second type in the middle, the third type is the base of odontoid fracture. And I think this is my last slide. Good luck to everybody. Thank you very much. And I would like to extend my regards to everyone who is attending this meeting and thank you for uh, giving me the honor to be part of this webinar. Uh, I also like to extend my thank and appreciation to my uh, famous professor, Dr. Karim Vessel, uh, who was my mentor in University of Shiraz and uh, my colleagues uh, and my classmates, Dr. Javad Salabian and Dr. Uh, Aras, which came later, and they are all good friends and other friends, which I don't have time to name, but I love them all and respect them all. And I wish I could see them. Uh, and if you guys can see them, please extend my regards. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Any Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tehran, for the excellent presentation. And I thank you. I think you're definitely a true teacher. I am an abdominal radiologist, but I learned too much from your cases. 
So uh, I think we have around 10 minutes to take some questions from the audience uh, and participants. The chat is open now and the uh, participants can write their uh, questions and I will ask them from, the, from Professor Tehran Zadeh. Is there any question from the audience? I mean, too many messages to thank you <laughs> for this excellent presentation you. as you see it here. So uh, let, me, let me ask one question, uh, just I'm an abdominal radiologist, but uh, maybe I can have a very basic question from you. Uh, for, for this question is about your first case that, uh, how frequent do you see adhesive capsulitis in your clinical practice? Because we usually uh, receive many, many requests considering concerning this, uh, I mean, diagnosis from the orthopedics but surgeons, but uh, the, the definite diagnosis is not too much. So how frequent do you see in your, I mean, imaging at your clinical practice? Well, I would say that uh, first of all, the patients who have adhesive capsulitis, uh, they are really, really uh, have severe pain. Uh, so clinically, um, uh, they have very limited range of motion. They clinically, uh, Basically, if, you, if they are on the table of the floor or you touch the floor table, they jump as, because of pain. That's their clinical, and the range of motion is decreased. The diagnosis uh, is not uncommon. Actually, you see them in the clinic, and basically, when you see, as a radiologist, you have to look for it. If you don't look at the rotator cuff interval, if you don't look at the coracohumeral ligament, if you don't look at the inferior glenohumeral ligament, you may miss it. You have to look and see whether those scars are present because rotator cuff interval has a lot of fat. If you don't see fat in the sagittal images in the rotator cuff interval or other images, then you have to really say why we are and if you are doing arthrogram and you cannot inject more than five cc in the joint, normally you can inject 15 cc. You shouldn't inject 15 cc. For arthrogram, seven cc is enough. But in the old days, we used to inject 15 cc in the joint. But in these cases, you cannot inject more than five cc. You know that you are dealing with uh, adhesive capsule. Well, uh, right. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Zahra Qomi. Uh, she is asking about what is the difference between Mayer dysplasia and Perthes disease? I think you mentioned it. Yeah, it's a big difference. Uh, like Calvay Perthes disease or idiopathic ischemic necrosis of the femoral head is a disease but Mayer's dysplasia is a normal variant. In other words, in Mayer's dysplasia, the femoral head doesn't get large. The femoral head is normal in size, but it is fragmented. And it appears around age two and it goes away after age six. And usually the shape of the femoral head becomes normal. In leg practice disease, the head is not only fragmented, it is very irregular. The cartilage of the femoral head is very thick. And as a result, the femoral head gradually dislocates laterally, subluxes them laterally. And eventually, when you grow up, you are going to get osteoarthritis. But it's a totally different. So, so that, therefore, when they are children, it may come to differential diagnosis, but easily on follow-up, you will notice that that's one normal variant, Mayer's dysplasia. The other one is a disease. Which Thank you. Thank you. And one more question from uh, Professor Ali Hekbatnia from Isfahan. Uh, he's asking uh, that, uh, do you have any case of mineralosis associated with osteopyokilosis? Combination of osteopoikilosis and melioriostosis. 
I don't recall seeing that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if I see that because they are same spectrum of the disease. They are compact bones in a spongy bone. And I haven't seen it, but I would not Thank you. It. Thank you. We have many, I mean, a wide spectrum of audiences from young residents and full professors in this session. Wonderful. Thank you. I just want to extend the appreciation and note of thanks of all the participants to you for your excellent uh, presentation again. Uh, thank you. So by this, I would like to move to the next speaker, uh, just to save the time. The next speaker is Professor Mahmoud Mafi, uh, one of the living legends of the head and neck and neuroradiology. And he's currently Emeritus Professor of Radiology at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I was surprised that I was that I noticed that he has he has, uh, he has earned his medical degree from uh, Tehran University uh, 52 uh, years ago, uh, and he has authored uh, and co-authored more than 150 publications. He has served as president of the American Society of Hedonic Radiology Eschner and received the gold medal of Eschner in 2006. He's the leading author of a classic textbook of Hedonic Radiology. And uh, by this very short introduction of Professor Murphy, I have the honor to welcome uh, Professor Murphy to start his talk. Uh, please, Professor Murphy, good evening there. I think it's uh, 9 p.m. in California. Please. Five. Okay. So can I open this? Yeah. You share a screen. Okay. Yeah. Share a screen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Dr. Rodmer, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, happy Thursday, early Friday to all. I am Amud Mafi from San Diego. In the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I have uh, the pleasure to review some of the uh, neuro head and neck cases uh, in a border review format. And uh, let me start with the first case. Can I go to? Is here, can we have to put it? Yeah. Uh, before I start to show you the cases, I like to express my recognition of many of my uh, outstanding fellows when I was at University of Illinois in Chicago and here at UCSD. And uh, I'm using some of the cases that they have prepared for our weekly neuro head and neck courses. So I wanted to make sure that they have been recognized. The first case start with a uh, adult patient with the, who was complaining of chronic headache and it was positional and then uh, develop a, a six nerve palsy 
just during the course of the disease. Uh, and the patient has no previous history of a specific uh, entity. So they ordered some MR. You see that we have a sagittal pre-contrast and we have T2 axial and we have post-contrast axial and coronal sections. The interesting finding that you see are the enhancement that we see involving the dura and involving part of the cavernous sinuses here and here. So we are dealing with an entity which has resulted in thickening and enhancement of the dura. There is no involvement of the leptomeninges. Leptomeninges means arachnoid and pia. There is no in, in, in enhancement of the leptomeninges. So meningitis is not included in this, in, in, the, part, in the differential diagnosis of, of this case. So we are dealing with thickening of the dura. Usually when you have this packy meninges, it may be related to lymphoproliferative disease. It may be related to granulomatous disease may be related to vasculitis, including uh, veganers, and it may be related to a CSF hypotension, or in other words, brain hypotension. When the patient that they have shunting, if there is significant drainage by the shunt, you see that there is subdural Hygroma, and you see thickening of the dura, and you see enhancement of the dura when you use contrast. In the context of no previous history, but then with this thickening of the dura and six cranial nerve palsy, always we should consider the brain hypotension or CSF hypotension. If that is in mind, then it is easier to explain why the brain is sagging down, why the tonsil is below the level of the foramen magnum, and why the pituitary stock is not well seen, because the brain is sagging down, it is displaced down. So we raise the question of CSF hypotension, but we ask question, was there any previous lumbar punctures? They said no previous lumbar punctures. Was there any previous history of surgery, lumbar surgeries or spine surgery? No history of such surgery. So they, they confirm that the patient has a low CSF the open pressure was very low. They confirmed that the patient had CSF hypotension, but these are a, the idiopathic or a spontaneous CSF leak. So they wanted us to show the cause of this CSF hypotension. So we decided to do an intrathecal, or in other words, inject contrast in the intrathecal space to do a CT myelogram. And when we did that, we realized that there is contrast in the lateral aspect of the paravertebral soft tissues. So we realized that the patient is leaking contrast on both sides, particularly on the right side. So these are the patients that they are leaking very slowly and for a long time. And they are complaining of headaches and particularly positional headaches. And when they develop six cranial nerve palsy, then the neurologist or the neurosurgeons, they come after us to say, what is the cause of it? And in order to show that, so if it is, 
idiopathic or it is spontaneous, most of the leaking is at the cervicothoracic level. So if you do intrathecal injection, you may end up to see the, the process. So the diagnosis was intracranial hypotension. How can I get rid of this? Uh, uh, how can I? Please, we see something like. Well, so the diagnosis is uh, that was intracranial hypotension. And uh, you see the. This overlap. Uh, Dr. Rob, okay, no, it's getting better. You are this is screen sharing. Uh, stop. No, no. So this is coming. This is a message from Zoom. It's coming it's from this window away from application. Yeah. This window. I think they are just sending me. Excuse me, Prof. Samafi. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you please? Uh, stop sharing and start sharing again. Okay, and then Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, so the diagnosis of intracranial hypotension, and they are the findings that I described already. So you see downward displacement of the brainstem, and you see diffuse thickening of the dura. Whenever individual loses the CSF, the brain volume should be fixed. Therefore, the dura it is like a sponge, expand. So there is intradural fluid collection. And it is, and, and, and if the process is so bad, so there is subdural hygroma. There is fluid in the subdural space. So we see subdural hygroma, we may see sub, subdural hematoma. And those are the main findings. This is another patient with CSF hypotension. You see significant thickening of the dura with enhancement. Why these patients with CSF hypotension, they have a six cranial palsy. The consensus of the opinion is that when there is downward displacement of the brainstem, the six cranial nerve is stretched and that creates a six cranial palsy. This is a patient who had a lumbar surgery and the patient came back two days later or a few days later with bilateral six cranial nerve palsy. I had been advocating one of the cause for this six cranial nerve in the past many years is related to the fact that the six cranial nerves extend into a very tiny canal, it is called durello canal. There is extension of the dura within the durello canal. So whenever there is expansion of the dura and thickening of the dura, therefore this nerve within the dura within the neural canal become compressed. And that explains why we have six cranial nerve palsy more than any other intracranial palsy, part of this brain hypertension. 
The second case that we have is a 20 year old female who presented with a large intraoral mass. They did a CT and the CT showed a large intraoral mass with destruction of the heart palate. In such a young age, a large mass in the oral cavity with destruction of the alveolar process of the maxilla raised a question by the radiologist that this may be a rhabdomyosarcoma. Although in this age group, young even, you may have tumor arising from the minor salivary gland, such as pleomorphic adenoma, such as adenocystic tumors, and even some term lymphoma, including very rare T cell lymphoma. But they thought that this lesion, because of the age of the patient, and this large mass is a rhabdomyosarcoma, they send the patient to another university and they did MR, and this is T1, you see the mass. You see the mass in the oral mass, it is relatively high contents on T2 and after contrast enhances. There is also additional finding and um, that is edema of the pterygoid muscles on this side compared to the other side, an enhancement of the pterygoid muscles. They biopsy this mass and the path came back as giant cell tumor, very aggressive giant cell tumor. So the patient was scheduled for my maxillectomy, very extensive surgery of the base of the skull, including removal of the tumor in the infratemporal fossa. Then the day before surgery, I got involved. And when I was consulted, I asked them, what is the diagnosis? They said, this is a tissue. The biopsy was compatible with joint cell tumors. I did not like it because a giant cell tumor should not metastasize to the muscle or to extend in the infratemporal fossa. If they would have told me this is a lymphoma, I would have accepted it. If they would have told me this is a rhabdomyosarcoma, I would have accepted it. But for the giant cell tumor to do this, I did not accept the diagnosis and then in my mind, I became suspicious that this may be a reactive giant cell tumor. So I asked the surgeon to postpone the surgery, brought the patient the next day, and I wanted to make sure that there is no parathyroid adenoma, that this is not a reactive giant cell tumor. This is the so-called brown tumor you know that a parathyroid hormone has the capability to produce osteitis fibrosa cystica, classically with cyst and hemorrhage, and sometimes looks like a so-called aneurysmal ball cyst, and it has the capability for peripheral infiltration in the soft tissues like this. What we are seeing here and here and here and here is just related to reactive giant cell infiltration because of the increased protomo, para, parathyroid hormone. And the only thing that they did, they removed this nine millimeters parathyroid adenoma, and you see that all these changes went away and at the site of the surgery a year or maybe later there is a little bit calcification so the lesson that i want to say is that giant cell tumor at least in the head and neck when you get that diagnosis 
from a pathologist, you have to be very careful that this may not be a true giant cell tumor. In fact, true giant cell tumor in the head and neck are not that common. Reactive giant cells, these brown tumors are more common. And traumatic giant cell in the, in the mandible, the so-called traumatic or reparative giant cell granuloma are more common. These are related to the giant cell formation because of blood byproduct and giant cells, which are all hemosiderin laden giant cells. So that is a case as a giant cell tumor. Our third case is a patient uh, okay, I lose some of the information here, but, but this was a patient who developed bilateral optic neuritis and came a few days later with sign of spinal myelopathy. So they asked for a MR of the spine, cervical spine, you see that? There is a long segment of significant edema of the cord, and there is some patchy enhancement. When you see this, it gives you the impression of the so-called transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis is a non-specific entity. It can, it can be related to virus, particularly herpes virus one or even eight virus. It can be related to demyelinating disease. It can be related to vasculitis. It can be related to granulomatous disease, particularly sarcoidosis. But in the context of bilateral optic nerve neuritis and transverse myelitis, one should be concerned about the neuro myelitis optica, or the so-called Derix syndrome, which was this case. You know that in this entity, you can find antibody against aquaporin-4. So if you have bilateral optic nerve neuritis, and a picture of spy, a uh, transverse myelitis, so the lab work, if the lab work shows an antibody against the aquaporin-4, so that is compatible with neuromyelitis optica. And you see this patient many months later did relatively well. You see that there is no more edema of the, of the spina, cervical spine in this patient. In general, when we have a patient with bilateral optic nerve neuritis, in this case, the patient has optic head papillitis and optic nerve neuritis. So if the brain shows plaque, it could be MS. But then you may have a plaque even in some other entities, such as MOG optic neuritis, which I will discuss about it. But once you are dealing with this, if the lab work shows the oligoclonal IgG band, so it is most likely a classic MS. If the lab work shows antibody against the aquaporin-4, so that is a neuromyelitis optica like the previous case that I showed. There is another condition which is called myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein IgG associated optic neuritis. This myelin or MOG is a protein part of the myelin of the central nervous system. So if there is 
a the antibody against this protein result in similar pictures as MS and in particular neuromyelitis optica. And this is an entity that sometimes it is seen more in kids, children, rather than adult. It sees in adult and children. And in the past, they used to call it children MS, but it is different from a classic MS and it is important for the clinician to know, is this a classic MS? Is this a neuromyelitis optica or is this a MOG related optic neuritis. So all is in the a evaluation on the MR and evaluation by the lab work. Sarcoidosis is an entity that has many, many different features in the neuroaxis. This is a patient with bilateral optic nerve neuritis related to neurosarcoidosis. And this is another patient, very similar to a transverse myelitis, very similar to a neuromyelitis optica. Very large segment of the core, even of the brainstem is edematous and there is patchy enhancement. These are all sarcoid granulomas. Sarcoid loves the, the, uh, the leptomeninges, uh, the pia and arachnoid. So they are coalescence of granulomas within the different part of the leptomeninges. And they show this nodular enhancement either in the spine or either in the brain. And this is another case of sarcoidosis. The sarcoid can involve the brain stem or the cord itself and enhances. And it, this patient has intramedullary and extramedullary involvement. The extramedullary enhances like emanangiomas, but the intramedullary part result in significant edema of the core. And even sarcoid can be confused with a leptomeningeal, diffuse leptomeningeal process, such as leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, leptomeningeal melanomatosis leptomeningeal lymphomatosis. So can mimic many entities. And if you are living in, an, uh, in a part of the world that there is increased uh, number of patients with sarcoidosis, this is something that always should be part of your differential diagnosis. Unlike Neuromyelitis optica, and unlike sarcoidosis, tumors of the spines result in expansion of the cord. In particular, astrocytoma may involve a large segment of the cord, cervical thoracic. Most of the time, you see a large one in the thoracic segment. Epandemomas, the the cellular ependymomas are a common residence of the cervical cord. This is an astrocytoma which evolves and it shows very heterogeneous signal on T2 and it shows very heterogeneous enhancement on post contrast. Hemangioblastomas are an entity, it's a vascular tumor, very commonly seen in patients with one hyperlinda disease and often multiple. This patient also has one in the vermis, which is not well seen in this image. So you see that this is hemangioblastomas. You see a nodule and you may see nothing in the rest of the cord, 
but you may see a large cystic component related to this. This hemangioblastomas produce a lot of edema, either in the cerebellum, which most of the time in the vermis, or in the cord. So it may be associated with diffuse, distant edema of the cord. You have a medulla epithelium, you have a hemangioblastoma here, but the core down below may be very much edematous. You remove that hemangioblastoma, the edema goes away. So that is one of the characteristic of hemangioblastomas. And this is another core deletion. This turned out to be a oligo, which is not that common, but this is that very large mass which has expanded the core. This is T2 and shows very little, very little enhancement. So the tumor of the cords uh, is, uh, is not that difficult to make diagnosis. It results in expansion of the cord and contrast enhancement in particular, ependymomas are the one that shows more enhancement. Ependymomas are a tumor that they are more common in the spine than in the brain. Five to 6% of the intracranial tumors are ependymomas, but over most likely 60% of the spinal tumors are ependymomas. If it is cellular, ependymomas often we see it at the cervical level, enhances, they have a tendency for hemorrhage. And in a, a specific part, a, a, a specific type of this ependymomas called a mixopapillary ependymoma, which is this case. They call it mixopapillary because the, cell, the cellular component, they form a papillary configuration and they produce also mucin. And that explains why part of the tumor enhances, part of the tumor is not, enha is not enhanced. Mixopapillary ependymomas can can occupy the entire intertical sac and enlarge the tical sac. And for all practical purposes, it is almost always seen in the lumbosacral region. It's arising from the film terminalis. And even there are mixopapillary ependymomas outside of the tical sac, extra fecal within the pelvis. That is a very specific uh, type of. They enhance significantly and can be confused with paraganglioma's in the lumbar spine. If I see this with this much enhancement, with the increased vascularity, I saw this is compared with, with the paraganglioma of the distal core. But this is a mixopapillary uh, mixopapillary ependymoma of the lumbosacral. Our next case is a middle-aged patient with headaches, altered mental status and confusion. These are CTs. When you look at CTs, you get the impression that the anterior pole of the temporal lobe is abnormal. You see a little bit better here that the anterior pole of the temporal lobe is abnormal. You see now that there is upper extension to involve more from the temporal lobe and parahippocampal gyrus. As you go up, you see more and more involvement of the temporal lobe and frontal operculum, and you see the insular involvement. So we see some hypodensity, which involves 
mostly the temporal lobe and will extension to involve the insula. In general, when we see something that involves the gray matter and white matter, we think more in terms of infection or in terms of ischemia and infarction. Tumors, they involve the white matter, mainly they are arising, they are gliomas, they are arising from the glycide or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. But uh, infection involves a section of the white matter and gray matter. Infarction, the same thing. A tumor in the temporal lobe in particular here can mimic this, and that is ganglioglioma. Ganglio, uh, ganglioglioma is a tumor which has neuronal, uh, neuronal cells and glial cells. And uh, that is a tumor that is a common residence of the anterior pole of the temporal lobe, and it may be cystic and may be calcified. But, but never like this to involve the uh, segment of the temporal lobe and insula. So and in the context of headaches and a patient who came with mental state, with altered mental status and confusion, so we have to think of more serious things. So they did an MR, and you see the MR shows very similar to CT, the anterior pole of the temporal lobe, gray matter and white matter involved. Hippocampus is involved. Polyhippocampal gyrus is involved. And you see the insular lobe is involved. Temporal lobe is involved. This is all edema without significant mass effect. And then if that was an uh, infarct, you would expect to see cytotoxic edema. This, is, this should be very dark on ADC. We don't see that. This is basically some vasogenic edema that we see on ADC. So it was not restricted. So it is less likely that we are dealing with an infarct. And when you look at the post contrast, there is no significant enhancement in this case. So the combination of these findings and a little bit attention to the flare pulse sequence that there is something on the opposite side should raise the question of herpes virus type type one encephalitis. This is a very uh, emergency situation in terms of the practice of neurologists and in terms of the practice of neuroradiologists. And it is important to make the diagnosis as soon as possible. And sometimes they put the patient on antiviral medication before they get the result from the lab from the CSF study that there is DNA of the herpes virus type and, uh, and, and lab work. So this is a herpes type one encephalitis, very often involves both temporal lobe, but asymmetric. It may be symmetric, but often it is asymmetric. And this is the R case, which is asymmetric. This is another case with herpes virus simplex encephalitis, which is bilateral and relatively symmetric, but often it is asymmetric. This can be confused with sarcoid. These are the nodules of sarcoidosis, post contrast. And this is edema. It can be. Sometimes the clinical picture is not very obvious. So you have to keep in mind that sarcoidosis can mimic 
this HVC encephalitis. It can be seen in patients with tuberculosis. Keep in mind that tuberculosis is a basal meningitis. To see this much leptomeningeal enhancement in the sarcoid is not that common. You see it, but it is not that common. But when you see multiple glerianulomas in TB cerebritis, it is usually associated with a TB meningitis. And the combination of this and this should raise the question of tuberculosis meningitis. So that is an, the herpes encephalitis differential diagnosis should include limbic encephalitis, which is a paraneoplastic syndrome. It is an immune related encephalitis usually related to an CA of the lung or CA of the breast or the stomach. So it can easily mimic the pictures of um, herpes virus encephalitis. But you have the clinical information on the basis of the clinical information and a little bit of uh, discussion with the neurologist or the clinician, it is easy to see that this is likely related to the underlying disease, or even if there is no primary underlying disease, sometimes we do a PET scan and we find the, the unknown primary. Then the other things, but which should be part of the differential diagnosis of herpes encephalitis, is because this entity result in cytotoxic edema and vasogenic edema. You have intracellular edema and extracellular edema. The intracellular edema, which is cytogenic, cytotoxic, can be confused with the stroke. That's why when I showed the case, I said this could be like a stroke. So a stroke is part of the differential diagnosis. And vasogenic result in differential, could be related to metastasis, could be related to abscess, could be related to granulomas like a sarcoid and TB that I showed. And low-grade gliomas, particularly low-grade fibrillary astrocytomas, and the ganglia gliomas in the anterior temporal lobe can sometimes mimic the pictures of CSF, herpes, or I mean herpes encephalitis. This is another patient. This is our number, uh, maybe case number uh, four or five. And uh, uh, this is a 61 year old uh, female who presented with a mass, who presented with altered mental status and sustained headaches. They did CT. You see a relatively dense mass in the anterior pole of the temporal lobe with significant visogenic edema. In the sagittal view, you get the impression that this may be extraaxial. You see that there is pushing and cupping of the edematous white matter and it has a very large base with the bone. So you get the impression that this may be an extraaxial tumor, such as meningiomas, although meningiomas should not give you this much edema. You see edema in meningiomas when there is a little bit of PL, uh, vascular contribution. Not this much, but in the meantime, I show you the bone to see that there is no hyperostatic changes. This could be a metastatic bone disease with subperiosteal, epidural, and dural thickening, but there is no bone destruction. So that is not part of the differential diagnosis in this case. They did MR. You see that the distance on T2 is relatively 
hypodens, these are edema that you see, and enhances significantly. And there is an island of involvement in the bone, which confirms this is an extra axial tumor. And then we did an ASL. ASL is a very excellent pulse sequence. Non-invasively, it permits to look at the brain perfusion and vascular bed of the tissues. It is used for acute infarct. It is used for arteriovenous uh, malformation. It is excellent to make the diagnosis of dural arteriovenous fistula, even very small one. And, but this ASL is often positive in meningiomas. In other words, it shows significant hyperintensity. So in this case, did not show the increased perfusion by ASL. And on DWI, it is relatively hyperintense because lymphoma is a very high on your list, but usually lymphoma, which is a secondary lymphoma because this is esteroaxial. Usually they are restricted on DWI, but not always. 95% of them are restricted. But look, meningiomas are very hyperintense on ASL. Hemangiopericytomas that in the past, they used to be called angiomatous meningiomas are very hyperintense. So we excluded meningioma in our case, we excluded hemangiopericytoma, which is part of the solitary fibrous tumors. Now we see solitary fibrous tumors in the dura, including in the spine, even sometimes intramedullary solitary fibrous tumor arising from the, from the connective tissues. But in this case, the ASL shows no such hyperintensity, so we knew that this is not part of it, but final diagnosis was large cell lymphoma. And we know that not always all the large cell or the lymphomas, in particular large cell lymphomas, which are the most aggressive type of lymphomas, are hyperintense, or in other words, restricted on DWI. So by virtue of exclusion, it was easy to come close to the diagnosis of a secondary lymphoma. This is another, planum sphenoidale. Menangiomas, look how it is hyper intense on ASL. And if this is metastasis sometimes, you see not so much increased perfusion. And this is a patient with a chronic history of dizziness and pulsatile tinnitus. They are coming and going to many, many clinic. Nobody knows what is going on. You look at this uh, flare pulse sequence, you see edema of the nodule, you see the edema of the paravermian, white matter, you see magnetic susceptibility tells you that there is some hemorrhage someplace, and you see a little bit peculiar enhancement, but it is not clear what is this. It was really hard for us to come up with a, a, a conclusion that when we started to see that there is increased perfusion along the superior petrosal vein, and sigmoid sinus, then we realized by careful evaluation that there is an increased vascularity of the sigmoid sinus. In other words, there is a, a, a uh, increased vascularity of the cavernous 
carbon the the the, the, the transfer silos and the sigmoid silos and by looking at the MRA, this, this is a source image, you see that the occipital artery is very thick. So the combination of this and this prove that we are dealing with a, we are dealing with a arterial, dural arterial venous malformation, which was confirmed on angiography. And the reason that you see this is because of venous congestion, and this is edema, this is hemorrhage, and this is enhancement of the bed of the increased vascularity. So the combination of this finding and this finding was very helpful for us to say why this patient is suffering from chronic dizziness and from a left pulsatile tinnitus. Arterialization of the sigmoid sinus, as you can see here, also was related to this vascular morphosis, vascular morphosis. Primary lymphomas are seen in AIDS and patients immunocompromised they are very relatively dense and non contrast enhances homogeneously. Not significant edema, it may be multicentric. Dural and extra dural lymphomas, which are the secondary lymphomas, are related to systemic lymphomas. These are primary lymphomas, which are B cells. These are also often B cells lymphomas. And this is another primary lymphoma of the cerebellum. We see more of primary lymphoma in the posterior fossa than we see primary tumors in adult. This is a relatively dense or non-contrast. It is relatively high potency on flare pulse sequence, enhances on T1, and it is restricted on DWI. If this patient was a elderly patient with no history of AIDS or anything else, but patients after AD, they are immunocompromised. So the combination of these findings should raise the question of lymphoma. But if this patient was 20 years or 30 years old, I would have raised the question of medulloblastoma in adult Medulloblastoma often is involved the cerebellar hemispheres. In kids, it is a disease of the vermis, it's a midline lesion. And this is another case of lymphomas, of primary lymphomas of the brain and of the patient. Lymphomas, as you see, they may be very deeply seated and they are restricted bright on DWR, dark on ADC, and they may show ring enhancement. A ring enhancement is not unusual in lymphomas, but there, even with the ring enhancement, you see restriction. Ring enhancement, you may see in, in, uh, in uh, GBM, that those are not restricted. Less than 5% of this GBM may show some restriction. The GBM and the primary lymphoma of the brain, they have a tendency to go from one hemisphere to the other. They follow the commissure, including the septum pellucidum, including the corpus callosum, and they go from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So this is a GBM. And you see that the GBM diffusion is completely different from what you see that on. This is the next patient, which is an 85 years old female who presented with a diplopio when looking up. They did an MR and the MR shows a mass, which involves the part of the clivus, extend a little bit superiorly, 
that basically it is centered in the clivus, and this is flare, and this is flare, and this is T1, and this is post contrast. So I enhance this. So this was a case that recently sent to me from uh, one of my colleagues from Chicago, and then they reported uh, the case was done in New York. Uh, I, they reported as a, a, because the patient was 85, they thought this is a craniopharyngeomas. And uh, you see that there is no significant cystic component. There is very solid looking. The most part of the tumor is centered into the clivus. I did not like that diagnosis. And uh, I asked for CT. You see that CT shows that the clivus is involved. There's expansion. There is some intratumoral mineralization. And this is the highest sections. And uh, I was in favor of Cordoma. And uh, they operated in this patient. And that turned out to be a Cordoma in this 85 years old. The only problem that this patient had was a diplopia. Most likely was related to the compression of the sixth cranial nerve at the the roller canal. Cordoma may be seen in young patients. Very large cordoma, as you can see, with destruction of the clivus, sometimes extend into the nasopharynx. And it is very bright part of it, like chondrosarcomas. They are very bright on T2. They enhance, the enhancement may be significant or no significant. Cordoma may be confused with chondrosarcomas. Chondrosarcomas are centered at the level of the clivus and particularly apex of the pituspawn at the level of the sphenoid occipital silicondrosis and apex of the pituspawn. There is always a residual embryonal fiber cartilage which give rise to chondrosarcomas. Chondrosarcoma is not seen in young patients as much as cordomas. These are the diseases that in 50, 60, and older patients that you see. And this is a cordoma, which is in the it's a bilobe uh, cordoma. This is a chondrosarcoma. This is Gradian echo, which shows some most likely calcification. This is T2, this is T1, this is post-contrast, shows enhancement. This is another chondrosarcoma with no significant enhancement. And this is another chondrosarcoma which shows significant enhancement. So the enhancement of the chondrosarcomas which go from very little to moderate to significant enhancement, and that is part of the MR5. There is an entity which is called Echordosis physilophora. This is a benign residual rest of the notochord within the clivus. This patient was an 18 years old girl with a neuroendocrine tumor. We told them this is most likely Echordosis. Fizelophora, but they were considering that this may be metastasis. They went in and they confirmed that this was a, a benign residual notochordal remnant. This is part of it, as you can see, and it shows a little bit enhancement. But very often, the neuropathologists they see on post mortem a little bit of notochordal remnant which is attached to the ventral pons. And uh, um, these are benign, and very rarely they may cause a, a cordon. This is an 18 years old. I think I have maybe a few more minutes. 18 years old gentleman who shows a very large retrobulbar mass with calcification. This is T1, this is T2. And this is post-contrast. 
Now, this was a very difficult case. I could not make the diagnosis. And uh, uh, the reason for that is because the most common tumors of the orbit are lymphomas. The most malignant tumors of the orbit are lymphomas, which never calcifies. The most common benign vascular tumor in adult is cavernomas, which are intracoronal, very similar to our patient, but never calcify. The cavernomas, they have characteristic delayed enhancement. You see that in early post contrast, a little bit of enhancement, more, and in later on, very homogeneous enhancement. So, this is easy to make the diagnosis, but in general, they are benign tumors and never calcifies. So, and then hemangiopericytomas, which is a variant of the solitary fibrous tumor, they are malignant and they are seen in orbit. And they may be intercoronal, they may be extracoronal, or in this case, intercoronal, extracoronal, but those never calcify unless they have been radiated or they have done surgery and there is post surgical scar calcification. But then the diagnosis in this case of orbital soft tissue chondrosarcoma. Because I show you some chondrosarcoma of the skull base arising from the level of the sino-occipital synchondrosis and at the apex of the petrous bone. I show you this case to remind you that they are soft tissue chondrosarcoma. We published this case maybe 15 years ago. And when we started to look at the literature, we found at that time there were 40 cases reported in the literature. But in general, we know that when I was at AFIP, they had several cases of chondrosarcoma arising from the meninges, intracranial, not from the fibrocartilaginous or bony tissues, from soft tissue chondrosarcomas. In the orbit, primary amyloid can mimic that, can calcify, very similar to a nodal uh, amyloidosis that we see in the, in, in the cervical, in the neck, that they, you see multiple nodes with, with, with significant calcification related to amyloidosis. So it was clear that this entity was not part of all the most common intra orbital tumors and that was and uh, i think the last case or maybe the very few cases that i have is a young female who presented with two weeks history of headaches so you see post contrast enhancement no diffusion restriction and uh, uh, very similar to a pituitary adenoma. You cannot distinguish this from a pituitary adenoma. In fact, this was reported as pituitary adenoma, but it turned out to be lymphocytic adenohypophysitis. This is an autoimmune disease, or it could be related to the IgG4 related entities. Usually you see in pregnancy or postpartum, which is very important if you know that clinical information. It may be seen male too, but that is the case. And this is another way. We made the right diagnosis in this case when I was in Chicago. This is a, a lymphocytic adenohypophysitis. This is our case that I showed. So it is very similar to pituitary adenoma, except the fact that you have to have some clinical information to make the right diagnosis. The next patient is a four years old case, case number nine, with a supracellular mass, which is solid, with very few calcification or no calcification, and all supracellular with significant enhancement in a young patient, a craniopharyngioma, usually it is solid and cystic. So this is a midline tumor. This is a 
this germinoma or germinoma and germinoma is more common in the pioneer region more common in the pioneer region and it may be a tandem that means a dysgenoma of the pineal gland and a tumor in the subthalamic region. This is the same case. You see the enhancement in the pineal tumor and enhancement in the hypothalamic supracellular enhancement. So these are the ones that they refer to as tandem dysgenomas. Pineocytomas are the disease of adult, far, far rare than compared to this germinoma. This germinoma is the most common tumor in the pineal gland and part of pineal region. And most of the time they show themselves in the second, in the second decade of life. And they have a tendency for spreading and shedding cells in the subarachnoid space. So when I see this, or, or when you see this, I ask them to do CSF study to see if they can find the cells in the CSF rather than to go to do biopsy because by doing biopsy, already they spread tumor in the subarachnoid space. So that is, and these tumors are quite sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Part of supracellular mass in kids or adult is germinoma, craniopharyngiomas, Langerhans histocytosis. If the patient comes with hypothalamic pituitary axis syndrome, you have to think of Langerhans histocytosis. We talk about his lymphocytic adrenal hypophysitis, sarcoidosis. Is very important to remember it loves the chiasmatic system and supracellular system. Primary lymphoma in AIDS patients and immunocompromised patients and restricted. And then this is a tumor that they used to be called infundibuloma or granular cell tumors or myoblastoma, myoblastic tumors but it is now clear that it is arising from the pituitary site, which is a modified astrocyte. And that's why it is called pituitary cytoma. It is a benign tumor. Very often we see in elderies and even in post mortem, the neuropathologists, they see that. The last case is related to a very interesting case of a 12 years old boy who presented with total deafness and facial paralysis. You see destruction of the petrous bone. When I look at this case, I thought this is Langerhans histocytosis. And the other things that you have to think because of the age of the patient is that this patient might have a rhabdomyosarcomas, which has destroyed the petromastoid plate, or the patient might have metastatic, for example, Ewing sarcomas, or even a primary Ewing arising from the temporal bone. All lymphomas, lymphomas can happen at this age, including the um, uh, the uh, African or uh, uh, American, um, what is the name? Lymphomas. That can happen. But uh, I was thinking of that this is most likely because the patient not, didn't have significant symptom except a deafness and facial nerve paralysis. But despite the fact, that we were aware that in more adult patients and elderly, there is an entity of tumor which involves the temporal bone, destroys the temporal bone, and it is arising from the underlymphatic sac. The underlymphatic sac and duct is sitting in the vestibular aqueduct. 
So you see that the vestibular aqueduct is destroyed. There is significant destruction of the pitromastoid plate and the tumor is very huge. This is the same patient. And these are the patient that they have under the lymphatic sac adenocarcinomas. These are a relatively slow growing tumors, but relatively a low, a less aggressive adenocarcinomas. And in the past, most of this lesion reported as metastatic adenocarcinomas. When the neurosurgeons, they went in to open the head, the frozen section came back as adenocarcinoma. They closed the surgical bed and they started to look for the primary. They could not find any primary. So they radiated the patient. It was not until 1984 that Dr. Hefner at AFIP, he is a ENT pathologist that I had the pleasure working with him when I was at AFIP, he identified this tumor to be arising from the under lymphatic sac, and that's why they call it Hefner tumor. And this is the patient 15 years later. After this, they removed this tumor, and you see that still there is just surgical changes, no recurrence. They, if they remove this, if it is a small, they can cure the patient. Despite the fact that we knew this entity, I was not in favor of this to be a case of papillary under lymphatic sac adenocarcinoma, but to our surprise, this came back in this 12 years old, that's the only young patient that I have seen. The youngest patient that I had seen before was a 17 year old girl, which was published in Lari the Larigoscope many, many years ago by some other authors. But this is a case that uh, we published it in an issue of the uh, operative technique in otolaryngology head and neck surgery, March 19, uh, 2014, which, was, which I was the guest editor of that issue. We reported this as a papillary under lymphatic sac adenocarcinoma or Hefner's tumors. Uh, since Dr. Tumor's description, many, many papers came uh, after this. This papillary adenocarcinomas, they are seen in patients with one hyperlinda disease and often bilateral. This is the case of one hyperlinda disease with papillary adenocarcinomas of the under lymphatic sac. This patient also has a ependymomas and keep it in mind patient with neurofibromatosis systemic may have multiple ependymomas in the neuroaxis. And this papillary adenocarcinomas are quite bright. They are not very aggressive tumor. They are not very cellular, so they look bright and T2. And this is another patient with one hyperlinda disease with several hemangioblastomas. They remove a under lymphatic sac tumor from this side. Patient now has a small one on the opposite side, which has bled, and you see blood into the vestibule. So bilateral one hyperlinda disease is characteristic the bilateral under lymphatic sac tumors is characteristic of one hyperlinda disease. These tumors in one hyperlinda disease in the past, before this entity was known, was reported as papilloma or papillocarcinoma arising from the extension or lateral extension of the choroid plexus of the first ventricle in the foramen lusca. But this is just to remind you. Uh, Dr. Rodman, do I have any time or shall I stop at this level? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Marcia, uh, we, we, do, do you think we can uh, end uh, up to five minutes maybe or yeah, three minutes? Five five? Minutes. Five. This is, this is a case which is good for the residents and for others. Because part of this, I wanted to show some common 
uh, tumors of the posterior fossa for the resident spare parts. This is a very uh, characteristic tumor that uh, you see that the uh, involves the <coughs> involved the cerebellar hemispheres, and it is a slow growing tumor, large and with very much uh, estriation and thickening of the foliage. Uh, this is an, an entity which is called a, 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 a Lermit Duclos, uh, or sometimes they call it Purkinzioma. And the best name for that, in my opinion, is the dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytomas, which means that there is abnormal development of the cerebellar hemispheres. Usually it is unilateral. Maybe a small segment, or maybe the whole cerebellar hemispheres. So you see that the folios are very thick, and on tissue, they see so many neurons that they are abnormals. And that's why they call it gangliocytomas. These are ganglion cells, neuronal cells. These are a congenital malformation and a combination of congenital malformation and also tumor, benign tumor formation. And so this is the characteristic is that there is no edema, no enhancement, and uh, they have very much um, estriated appearance of the cerebellar hemispheres. And you never see in young kids, usually you see after the second decade, despite the fact they are, in my opinion, congenital. But part of this discussion, I wanted to discuss the most common posterior fossa tumor, medulloblastoma is a peanut tumor. It is arising mostly from the vermis, particularly from the superior medullary velum or even inferior or posterior medullary velum. This is the most common malignant tumors in pediatric population. This is a astrocytic juvenile pilus pilocytic astrocytoma, which is the most common tumors in pediatric. It may be inter, infra, or supratentorial, but if characteristic as a nodule and a cystic component, and this is a pandemoma, which is common after this. This is within the fourth, third, uh, fourth ventricle, can be confused with medullary stomas. This has a tendency for CSF spread, but this has a tendency for drop metastasis, similar to GBM. And the last thing is a low-grade brainstem glioma that we see in pediatric group. So medulloblastomas are peanut tumors, highly malignant. They have calcification or no calcification, but they are dense on CT. And they are high pointers on ADC. They are restricted, like pineoblastomas, medulloblastomas, esthesionoblastomas, all those, including Ewing's. They are peanut tumors, and they are very cellular. And as a result, they are restricted. And this is a six years, and this is the 14 years, I believe, with that was a 14 years old, if my memories uh, uh, help me uh, right. And this is a, a medulloblastoma with multiple subarachnoid seeding and with multiple, this is another patient, not this one, this is another patient with medulloblastoma with many, many intradural seeding of tumors. And this is a, two years old girl with ependymomas. Ependymomas may have some hemorrhage. They have some calcification, but not common. And this is a uh, brainstem, a uh, slow grade astrocytomas. They do not enhance. It is hard to treat them because of the location. 
very bright on T2. They do not show contrast. They have to be handled by the radiation therapy. And this is the typical a, a pilocytic astrocytomas that they have nodules and they have enhancement. If they can remove the nodule and they assist all the enhancement, the long-term survival is a rule in patients with a uh, pyrocytic juvenile pyrocytic astrocytoma. I think I'll stop. I wanted to show you a case of adenoid cystic tumor of the heart palate in a young patient, which is this case, but uh, the discussion should stop at this level. Uh, it was really a great uh, honor that I had the pleasure to discuss some of these cases. I usually uh, used to give a specific lecture on a specific topic rather than to review different cases because I have a tendency to expand the discussion a little bit more, but this is the way that uh, is the platform for this uh, board review. And I'm really pleased that if I was able to show cases that it is good for the residents and for the radiologists and for all these people that they, they were listening to me. Uh, I uh, want to thank everyone and uh, good night and uh, looking forward to listen to Dr. Shikoda's uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank you. much, uh, Professor Shikoda, uh, for your excellent presentation. Your, your lectures are always uh, educational, informative, and great. So uh, we have a few minutes that we can have some questions from the audience. So the chat box is now open for the participants. They can write their uh, notes and uh, or questions. Uh, just uh, I should add that uh, uh, Professor Murphy has kindly sent uh, his questions as a uh, multi-choice question to us that my colleague, my other colleague, Ms. Uh, Salary, has uploaded this file into the chat box. You can find it there and you can see the uh, questions. Uh, you should be able to answer this question following this excellent presentation of Professor Murphy. And you can see the correct answers at the end of this uh, file. So uh, note of appreciation and thanks to Professor Murphy again. And there's one question uh, that uh, from Dr. Zainab Islami, she's asking, is enhancement pattern can differentiate between cordoma and endosarcoma? Uh, uh, no, not really. Uh, very similar. The imaging of cordomas and chondrosarcomas can mimic each other's. Uh, for the chondrosarcomas, they are more common to be a, not in the midline, more in the lateral. Cordomas often, they are in the midline and uh, both can give very similar imaging findings uh, on the basis of CT and MR. The calcifications sometimes may be a little bit more characteristic in chondrosarcomas, but not to the degree that you can for sure. I use the clinical information age of the patients and the location of the lesions and some of the imaging findings together to come a little bit close to the differential diagnosis. That case that I showed, and you realize that it was growing in the clivus. It is more common for cordoma to grow in the clivus rather than the chondrosarcomas just to be in the clivus. Uh, that is, that is uh, to be the right answer is that it is not always to distinguish chondrosarcomas from uh, cordomas on the basis of imaging. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and one, one more question from uh, Professor Ali Akmatnia yeah. is asking yeah. about the value uh, of uh, angle of optic chiasm for uh, uh, assessing uh, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension. 
Is it useful to measure the angle of optic chiasm? Angle of optic chiasm. Optic chiasm. Angle. To, 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 uh, the question is uh, to measure the angle of the optic chiasm. Yes. Uh, 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 I, I need to know what the. Huh? Oh, for the for the for the for the CSF hypertension. Hypertension, yes, yes. right, right. Well, uh, in the coron if you have a coronal sections, and uh, uh, in the coronal section, sometimes you may see that displacement of the chiasm because the whole brain sags down. But I never use that. To be very honest with you, and. Uh, 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 I uh, uh, like more the combination of low-lying tonsils and a very small fourth ventricle, and uh, particularly the narrowing of the lower part of the fourth ventricle, and duron enhancement in particular. Uh, the combination of those, they should be enough to raise the question. but. I, as a radiologist, I'm not in favor of and measuring angles and so forth. To be very honest with you, I do not use a ruler in my practice. Never use something by measuring the size of something to come up with specific diagnosis. I like the combination of findings, clinical pictures, and to come with a comprehensive discussion to find out what is the most likely diagnosis? We have to narrow differential diagnosis in order to come up with a, in an intellectual diagnosis. I said the other day, I do not like the, the uh, stat diagnosis. This is not a good practice for the radiologist in particular for the resident to say, okay, if you see something in the chiasm or in the infundibular region, so it should be a hematoma of the senior uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, of hypothalamic uh, hematomas. And then very often when you ask the same, well, what do you mean by hematomas? Is this a glial hematomas? Or is this a ganglionic hematomas? They don't know. But that is, that is what I do not like. If you say something, you have to know that entity. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Murphy, for your excellent talk. And I just extend the, the note of thanks and appreciations of our participants to you. Again, we don't have time when we are at least uh, 30 minutes delay. So um, just uh, we should, uh, I would like to go to the next speaker. But just as a technical point, I should add for that the I would like to ask the audience that they should correct their full name in the participant uh, section of the Zoom account if they want to have the certificate of participation in this webinar. You know that the participation is, in this webinar is completely free. But if you had to, uh, if you want to have the certificate, uh, you had to register in the website in advance. So. Uh, let's move to the third speaker, uh, Professor Ali Shirkhoda, who is extremely famous for our Iranian radiologist and as an outstanding abdominal radiologist, he has been frequently invited as the guest speaker uh, to our annual Iranian Congress of Radiology over the past 30 years. Uh, his board review classes uh, at the time of Congress were very famous and I was one of his fans around 14 years ago. So uh, his uh, Professor Ali Shirfoda is the Professor of Radiology at University of California, Irvine. Uh, he was graduated from Isfahan University and I'm sure that we have some participants from this uh, beautiful historical city. He has uh, over 100 publications in peer reviewed journals and numerous book chapters. He has been honored with a, a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Society of Abdominal Radiology, or SAR, in 2013. So by this very short uh, and brief uh, introduction, I have the honor to welcome Professor Ali Shirkhoda uh, to start his talk. Uh, Professor Shirkhoda, please. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosnath. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, one thing I'm lucky that I have my moderator, uh, abdominal radiologist, because it's, if you can please the moderator, you're all done. So I'm, I'm halfway through. So <laughs> that's the good news for me. Uh, what I like to do is really, uh, uh, is going to review some cases with you, with the residents, and I heard there are some attendings, but I'm not going, I'm going to show cases which are practical for you. I want to learn at least one issue, uh, what I call it a take home point from each case uh, that I show it to you. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to uh, categorize my cases into uh, five or maybe six categories, there is a time allowed. And that would be basically talking about uh, the uh, bowel and three categories of vascular, inflammatory and neoplastic conditions, and then move into liver, and then uh, very briefly on pancreas. And if there are any time left, I'll go for GI. I'll try not to go over time, but I may go for at least five minutes, but I will try not to, okay? The questions are a part of the presentation that you will have choice to pick up. And that's really a self-assessment, but nobody's going to be quizzing you. It's self-assessment. So if you want to pick up a piece of paper, mark your question down, and then when I discuss that, you can figure out to see what you were correct, and I'm sure you will be correct in most, if not all the cases, okay? All right, let's start with this case. 53-year-old uh, man with abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea, okay? Now, what is the most likely diagnosis? Here we see the colon being abnormal in the left side of the abdomen. Is this really hemorrhagic colitis due to anticoagulation or pseudomembranous colitis or ischemic colitis or on colon cancer? Well, one thing I can tell you, this patient was not on anticoagulation, so we can say that's not the case for sure. The second case I want to tell you, if the right colon was pretty normal because the entity of pseudomembranous colitis is the condition which involves almost always the entire colon, we call it pancolitis, including the rectal sigmoid colon, okay? That's the usual manifestation which happens after antibiotic therapy, and it's treated with certain type of antibiotic. Otherwise, manifestation can be the same. Usually, diarrhea is the, is the manifestation. Uh, and then we come to carcinoma of the colon. Usually, is presented with a mass in the colon with proximal dilatation. That's one of the manifestations of carcinoma. As we know that one of the causes of hematochesia or GI bleeding is colon cancer. Of course, not the most common because the most common, after all, is diverticular bleeding. Okay. And the hematochesia, when we do a CT scan, they present either as an obstructive mass or as an intussusception, for example. And usually we see a transitional zone between the tumor and the normal wall of the colon, proximally dilated, distally being normal, as you can see here, that's the sigmoid, which is normal. So this is not really the case. Plus there are adjacent lymphadenopathies in the case of colon cancer. So that's really leaves that with one entity that is ischemic colitis. And that's what the diagnosis is, if you correctly diagnose that. It's almost always non-occlusive due to hypotension or hypoperfusion. It's usually the area that we see that in this case is splenic flexure of the colon. And it's usually manifest, uh, managed conservatively and not surgically except when there is an infarction of the colon, which that has been removed. And that has to do with us to make the quick diagnosis and get the surgeons involved or endoscopy. So the next question I have for you, which segment of the colon is most prone to ischemia and why? Is it ascending, hepatic flexure, splenic flexure, sigmoid or rectal? Why? The answer is, of course, the splenic flexure, because as you know, here it says the statistic for you, left colon is about 50 to 90%. All colon very rarely we see that. Right colon, again, about a third of the case, almost, transverse colon and the sigmoid. And you can see that area of the uh, Hispanic flexure of the colon, they call it watershed area. And that's really where the, uh, the uh, transverse artery, but it's a place with, for the anastomosis between the ascending uh, left uh, colic artery and the marginal artery of Drummond that we see here, anastomosis. And that is really the most common place for uh, for ischemic infarction, for uh, ischemia. Uh, ideology is many things, obviously, is usually, it's not occlusion necessarily. Uh, diminished blood flow within the bowel wall, maybe due to anything can cause that. Uh, 
because the mucosa and submucosa are very sensitive to hemorrhage, you, to ischemia, they usually get uh, sloughed mucosa, ulceration of the mucosa, a lot of GI bleeding, and gradually you can see the mucosa is coming off the wall of the colon and, uh, and the patients bleed. Endoscopy is where you make the diagnosis, but we often are asked to do CT scan and we should be able to make the diagnosis. If you do happen to do a bearing minimal, that really doesn't tell you a whole lot here. You can see the splenic flexure is very much like a thumb printing, a classic picture that has been described, but that's really non-specific for making such a diagnosis. CT scan is far more specific to make the diagnosis. Let's look at this case, 59 year old with diffuse abdominal pain and, and hypotension, okay? Here is the upper abdominal image at the level of the celiac axis, but we see there is a very narrow celiac axis, okay? And there is the splenic artery and hepatic artery, but look at that here, that's the thrombosed celiac axis. You go further down, we see the bowel lobes are dilated, okay? Some contain fluid. You go further down at the level of the superior mesenteric artery, is again, that artery is also thrombosed, okay? Again, look at multiple dilated bowel loops. And then go further down, you see this inferior mesenteric artery. So this patient has actually a major problem due to thrombosis of all three major blood supply to the mesentery. And as a result, there is bowel ileus, there is lack of perfusion of multiple loops of bowel, there is edema of the adjacent mesentery. And on the top of that, we have blood fluid level in the, in the small bowel. You can see not only the distended, but also have fluid fluid level due to hemorrhage inside the lumen of the small bowel. So we are dealing with a patient who has extensive mesenteric ischemia, thick, I mean, a lack of perfusion to the wall wall, hemorrhage within the lumen, which I showed you earlier, why they bleed in the bowel wall, in, in the lumen of the bowel, and as a result, they develop diarrhea. Look at the colon not being involved here. You can see the colon sitting back here in this case because of perhaps due to collaterals or less involvement of the right side of the bowel. Again, perhaps due to collaterals. So what are the causes of acute mesentic ischemia? Occlusive is the majority of the causes, okay? Such as arterial occlusion, Venous occlusion, they both can cause mesenteric ischemia. And we'll talk about the causes for that, what causes mesenteric uh, occlusion. And then non-occlusive, which are about a third of the time, low blood flow, such as patient with cardiac issues, patient with severe hypotension, obviously vasculitis, and mechanical obstruction, such as bowel obstruction in the case of strangulated hernia or internal hernia or any sort of obstruction closed loop uh, uh, obstruction of the bowel. So these all can cause some sort of ischemic bowel disease, okay? So our job as a radiologist is to find the cause, find the etiology of the underlying cause, find the severity of that, and relate that information to the clinician and, and, and who wants to treat the patient. So what are the CT or acute bowel ischemia? Obviously, one thing I already mentioned that you was bowel involvement. Now, bowel can be hypoperfused, or hyperperfuse. In this patient, if I tell you there is a major cause of this patient's ischemic bowel disease is some sort of non-occlusive disease. Because look at the aorta. Obviously, this patient has severe hypotension. Either there is bleeding someplace, or there is cardiac surgery, or the patient is in ICU. There is something causing that ischemic bowel disease. And there is acute bowel ischemia due to thickness of the wall also associated with that. Aside from that, there is also, uh, so there is bowel wall thickening, there is bowel wall dilatation, there is uh, a mesenteric edema, look at the extent of the edema and lack of perfusion of the bowel walls, okay? And then we have pneumatosis of the bowel wall plus air in the superior mesenteric vein, and of course in the portal system within the hepatic parenchyma, and then we have, um, Ascites, obviously we have a small amount of ascites and sometimes we see hemorrhage in the lumen which we saw that over here and here. And eventually the bowel wall, as I mentioned to you, could be increased enhancement or decreased enhancement. This being thicker than increased enhancement, perhaps due to inability to return blood flow or when there is a decreased enhancement here, you can see the arterial phase, really literally there is no perfusion of the bowel walls here. We'll look at some more cases as we move along. 
okay? Here is the superior mesenteric vein thrombosis, okay? What is causing that many, many things? In this particular patient happened to be a significant degree of Crohn's disease involving the bowel loops in the right lower quadrant and pelvis. That can cause thrombosis, but there is a whole gamut of causes of venous thrombosis, such as this and abdominal surgery, abdominal sepsis, hypercoagulable state, severe dehydration, and abdominal neoplasm. So they all can cause superior mesenteric vein thrombosis. And as a result of that, they would bowel, the bowel would be congested and infarcted or develop ischemia, okay? Now, the, 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 uh, the question I have for you here, question number three is, which of the following is not is not the usual cause of non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. Is it MI? Is it CHF? Is that AI, COPD, or following cardiac surgery? The answer is obviously COPD, because all of the others can be associated with non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, because all of them would be diminishing the pumping effect of the heart to supply blood or any of them can do that. All of them relate to the heart surgery can do that. COPD is not one of them, okay? Here is an example of the patient who had open heart surgery. And look at the superior mesenteric artery, how small it is, okay? And if you look at the bowel, there is a significant degree of disease perfusion. Obviously, there's some motion artifact here. But if you look at the, some of the bowel loops are perfused, and those are the ones which are pink at the time of surgery. And those are the ones which are not perfused. These are the ones which are blue at the time of surgery. And those of the ones who have air bubbles inside the lumen, inside the wall, those are the ones who are developed uh, uh, ischemia and uh, so-called the patient has developed infarction. And those are the ones which may have to be removed surgically. So we can be dealing with various levels of ischemic bowel disease, as you can see from perfusion, normal falls, maybe or decreased perfusion, lack of perfusion, and infarction and nematosis. So there are many levels that you can see in the same patient. Let's move to the second category, and that's really inflammatory bowel disease. It's a very interesting case. This patient is young, 26 year old. She's a woman from the west country of Ghana, came, has been in the United States for over a year or two, and presented with acute abdominal pain and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, but eight months treatment of Crohn did not work. Okay, so she was referred to our medical center for management. And then we look at her CT scan. Obviously there's a the very abnormal colon, right colon, I mean, cecum in particular, and there's associated area of appendix, meso appendix, salt and partial planes, and there are multiple lymph nodes enlargement and some of them even enhancing, and some of them necrotic. And I emphasize that word, okay? So these are the basic findings that we see in this patient. Now, what's the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Is it really a TI lymphoma with sickle extension? Is it really an adenocarcinoma or that's a tuberculosis or is this a backwash ileitis from UC? And then you say none of the above. If you don't believe in any of this, you can check, check E, none of the above. Well, let's talk about it. Well, lymphoma, quite possible, it can involve the terminal ileum because has a lot of lymphatic tissue, it can infiltrate into the cecum, but having necrotic lymph node in lymphoma or having enhancing lymph node in lymphoma is not a common feature, we don't see that, okay? The same thing for adenocarcinoma, having such a smooth margin adenocarcinoma, having with so much mass, you expect to see really obliteration of the lumen, and usually adenocarcinoma of the cecum can present with appendicitis because they can obstruct the lumen of the appendix. In fact, as we will discuss later in a patient, which is older patient, this is a young patient, if the patient develops appendicitis, appendicitis, think about cancer, okay? So really this leaves up with one thing, and I like to emphasize again, multiple enhancing lymph node, okay? Involvement of the TI, some of the nodes are necrotic, again with the arrow I pointed to, and there's a TI involvement here in the quarter of the image. So with this in mind, look at the proximal sequence being involved. This is the case of intestinal tuberculosis, okay? Intestinal tuberculosis is the case here. And interestingly, this patient in 80% of the time, diagnosis can be made by endoscopy 
and, and uh, by colonoscopy, I should say, and biopsy, and as in this case was done. This patient actually, uh, uh, the most common symptoms is abdominal pain. Sometimes these things can be palpable on physical examination as a mass on, uh, in the right toe quadrant. Uh, so the, in this case was thought to be actually cancer, uh, but luckily and biopsy, this was uh, 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 tuberculosis. And nevertheless, she was operated on because she had the colon has to be removed because of the size of that chronicity of this. And in fact, there was also diffuse peritoneal tuberculosis, which we can barely see that here because see some of them up here in the root of the small bone mesentery. So here is the actually the presence of necrotizing granulatus lesion from the wall of the ulcerated because of the sequence. So this was a uh, surgically proven uh, colon. So uh, this is something you have to learn to think about it in a patient who come with such a manifest, with such manifestation, uh, uh, especially if the patient is from the so-called uh, socioeconomic disadvantaged countries, such as the place the patient came from. Uh, after seeing this case, I, I went back and looked at the record. There have been other cases we have had from some areas of India, for example, or some areas of the Midwest, Mideast. So there are usually we see it in immigrant patients from other countries than in, in the native people in the United States. Because tuberculosis, to that extent, at least I haven't seen for the past 50 years I have lived in the United States. So that's not very common condition over there. Now let's talk about this case. 16 year old with cough, low grade fever and abdominal pain, all right? So this is really an interesting patient, young this patient. And if you look at the supine, which is on this side, on upright, we see signs that you suspect intestinal obstruction because there is air flow level, multiple air flow levels. But you call the clinician and obviously they tell you, no, there is no bowel sound. If that case, then you see, well, this may be ileus. Then you look very carefully. Anybody has seen anything? I wish you could hear that because people want to scream that yes, yes, I see a appendiculate in the right lower quadrant, okay? And I just showed it to you to confirm that so with that appendiculate, you say, uh huh, this patient has appendicitis, fine. But my question to you is, is this patient a surgical candidate? Okay. Or in other words, my question to you is, you call the surgeon to get ready for the operating room, or you recommend a weak antibiotic and then an unenhanced CT scan of the abdomen, or you say, no, 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 let's do a CT scan right away with oral IV contrast, or you want to get a chest x-ray to rule out pneumonia. And that's fine, if you want to do that, that's nobody's going to blame you get a chest x-ray, a lot of people do that. But this patient's problem is not cough, is the right door called the pain of appendicular, okay? So the answer to that would be, let's do an emergency abdominal and pelvic CT scan. And I'll show you why you need to do that. Because when you do that and give oral contrast, and you can see there's a bowel wall here, bowel loop here, and then you see the appendiculate, and you can see there's a perforated appendix. Here's an appendix with a thick wall, but it's open down here. It's perforated. This appendicle is almost ready to fall down somewhere else. And then you can see there is a track of pus with thick wall, thick wall coming down into the pelvis and coming down, accumulating here. And you can see it's communicating with that pus coming from the appendix into the pelvis. If you lower here, you can see that collection here. And this collection is very important. This is not bowel loop distension. This is bowel loop distension has a very thin wall and lack of enhancement. This has a very thick wall and circumferential enhancement. So this is collection of pus. This is dilated appendix, which is perforated. And this is distended bowel as a result of ileus. So with that in mind, what are you going to do? The nightmare for the surgeon is to open the patient and faced with so many collection of pus. You don't want to do that. You as a radiologist want to handle this patient. So you call the surgeon and you tell them, let me to drain this patient. This patient is my job to put the tube in the, this collection in the right, in the mid abdomen. So you can use the transducer by ultrasound and push down and put a cat guide wire inside this and drain it. And that's exactly what's done. IV antibiotic was started ultrasound guided drainage was done, 250 cc of pus was drained, and then six weeks later, an elective appendectomy was done. Not an emergency. The mortality and morbidity of emergency surgery is very high in this patient because of the potential development of 
with diffuse peritonitis, you don't want to do that. But if you treat this patient the way I just mentioned to you and guide the surgeon, don't take the patient to surgery because many surgeons, when they see appendiculate, they say, all right, this is appendicitis. But you see only appendiculate, about 10% of appendicitis, of appendicitis, not more than that. So you're lucky to the patient has appendiculate, but nevertheless, even the patient didn't have it, you have to go ahead and do uh, a CT scan, okay? So much for that. 60-year-old man with abdominal pain and GI bleeding. What do you recommend? Look at the film very carefully. I really, you know, sometimes when our resident, they, they used to deal with the films and view box. There was no computer. They used to tell us, put your nose on the film and look. All right, now I want you to put your nose on the screen and look, okay? And what you see here is tell you, is this really next step is angiography? Is this upper GI endoscopy? Is it an abdominal and pelvic CT? Is it a barium enema? Or it's upper GI barium? What do you want to do next? Or you do nothing. I'm going to throw in something else, another choice. Okay. The answer is look at the careful here. I go back again. Look at this area here. Look at what you don't see here and you'll see here. Okay. So what you see basically is a soft tissue mass crossing the midline to the left side within the transverse colon, okay? The transverse colon is partially seen. There is lack of seeing the hepatic flexure and ascending colon, you don't see it. So when you see the combination of these findings, what comes to your mind into susception? What is causing that? Either it's going to be benign, it's always either benign tumor such as lipoma, gist and so forth, or it's a malignant tumor such as adenocarcinoma. But you've got to make the diagnosis on the plain film and you'd not, you don't need to do CT scan at this stage. In fact, what you do is, and the answer is you do a barium emma. Somebody say, well, that's an old fashioned way. It is not. This patient needs a barium enema because by doing that, you can reduce the interception, push it back into the ascending colon. That is where the tip of that was over here a minute ago. By doing barium enema, you push it back down here. And then what you do next, you basically do a barium enema followed by colonoscopy and biopsy, followed by CT staging if that turned out to be cancer, followed by surgery. And this is exactly what was done. And the patient had the right hemicolectomy for a cecal cancer ascending to the upper, uh, into the upper uh, uh, ascending colon in other words and intersuscepting all the way into the transverse colon, okay? So this was the proper management. CT scan was done, obviously, for the part of staging, but you, you did it when you know the patient has cancer because after biopsy by colonoscopy, diagnosis of cancer was confirmed, which has intersuscepted, and then the patient underwent CT scan for staging to make sure there's no metastasis elsewhere or there's nothing in the liver or so forth, okay? Now, sometimes the CT scan may be done even before endoscopy, as if this was the case and the diagnosis of lipoma was made, because that can be very much classic for the diagnosis of uh, on the CT scan, okay? Wow, what is that? Hmm. Anybody? Well, let's discuss this case. This is one of my favorite. This just came out actually in, in our hospital about a month and a half, two months ago. And so that's, that's very, very fresh, in other words. And you can see there is the rectum should be here, all right? Remember, it says 57-year-old rectal bleeding comes to the ER with sudden onset of abdominal pain. So he has been bleeding that he has been attributed to, you know, hemorrhoid, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, some patients don't pay attention that much that you really think they should be. Okay, but anyway, when the patient has sudden onset, then he was brought to the emergency room because of severe pain. And now you can see here, there is something in the lumen of the rectum and it contains something else which is enhancing. And it's kind of pulling down all the mesenteric fat and vessels with it. So what's the diagnosis? That's very classic. Another case of intersusception. And this case is the sigmoid adenocarcinoma with rectal intersusception. Let me show you another classic case, okay? Here is, you can see again the tumor, another patient. Now we have rectal wall and then sigmoid wall here with air in it and the tumor is down here. 
So we have air between that and the rectal wall and the tumor within the lumen of the sigmoid. So you, you may see that, you may not see that, but when you see this feature, okay, this is a classic picture of interception, sagittal, but especially coronal image, which I showed you on the previous case, helps you to make a diagnosis. Let's talk about this case. Any of these two patients has cancer, patient A and patient B. Let's look at the patient A first, okay? Now, we see a mass in the right lower quadrant, kind of medial to the terminal ileum. Terminal ileum is kind of draping on this mass. Let's move a little bit backward. Then we can see again the mass further out. Again, we can see folds of the colon pretty much preserved, okay? No adenopathy, very sharp margin around the cecum. You can see that here. And um, so what is the diagnosis? Does the patient have cancer or not? Differential diagnosis obviously would be, is it a carcinoma, lymphoma, metastasis, melanoma, hematoma, endometrioma, carcinoid of the appendix? Of course, intersusception, I'll just put it in for whatever. So what is this could be? Well, it's, could be the sad no carcinoma. Well, the patient's young, but I've seen cancer as young as 20, 21 years old, okay? But remember, I used to work at the MD Anderson Hospital, which the cancer is the macro of cancer. Every cancer from the world comes there. So I've seen all. So could it lymphoma? Yes, of course it can be. Metastasis, unusual for this location, but it could be. There is no history of trauma, obviously, and there is no anticoagulation. Could this be in the metrioma, of course, Carcinoid usually doesn't present like that. I'll show you another case, you will, you will agree with me. So what the question again is, does the patient have cancer? Yes, no, or I don't know. If you don't know, what information do you need? You need to know that this patient has rectal bleeding episodes and the episodes is coinciding with her menstrual cycle. So what's the diagnosis? This patient has cecal endometriosis. Okay. So that piece of information really get you off the hook, but at least even before that, you can always rule out, sometimes the diagnosis is made by ruling out certain things such as carcinoma or a carcinoid or, or other things that I mentioned to you, okay? Now let's look at case number two, 32 year old male with right lower quadrant pain, borderline WBC. Okay, now we have a few lymph nodes here. I put arrow on the biggest one here, and then I'm going to move down and show you the area of the ileocecal valve. This image, the first one I showed you was above the ileocecal valve or just about that. This area of ileocecal valve, we can see the fat here. So we're going down and then we see the area of appendix, which is located at the tip of the cecum. And then again, we see that appendix or soft tissue density here. And there is again some lymph nodes here. So one thing we see here is a very, is further down. So the question I have for you, what's your diagnosis? The most likely diagnosis, is it appendicitis? Is it sickle carcinoma with appendicial infiltration? Is it the carcinoid of appendix? Or well, it's a normal variation of the appendix. Remember, I'm one of the fans of normal variant. I have the whole book on that subject, okay? So, so I have to put it in. Uh, so what, which one you would pick up? Well, we know that's not appendicitis because the fat around the appendix looks very clean. And I can tell you if there was a pre-contrast, post-contrast, the lumen will enhance in this case, not the wall. Appendicitis, the wall enhance, not the lumen because the lumen contains pus. But if there is a tumor in the appendix, then the lumen will enhance. So with that in mind, what do you think is the diagnosis? laparoscopic appendectomy was done. And this was, uh, diagnosis was thought to be early appendicitis, but pathology proved this to be a carcinoid with some positive lymph nodes. Remember, carcinoid can pack the whole appendix basically, but it can be at one point. And carcinoid of the appendix, by the way, is not rare. It's actually very common. Look at that, out of 40, almost 1400 cases of carcinoid reported after the thorax, tracheobronchial uh, tree, which was about 25% of the cases, uh, GI tract is the most common place for the carcinoid and the appendix, rectum and ileum pretty much stay the same. 
at, as far as incidence is concerned, okay? About 12% or 1,650 cases were in the appendix and contain like half of the, GI, of the, uh, the uh, uh, pulmonary and tracheal bronchial tree that is, is, is the appendix. So it's not rare, it's a common tour of the appendix that if you have a busy practice, you should see it. And if you don't see it, you've been missing something, okay? So the home take home point for this case is pay attention, not just thickness of the appendix, which normally we have been taught it should be about seven millimeter, but that's the measurement which has been reported by ultrasound, but it pretty much also applies to CT scan too, okay? But it's not always the case, but look at the lumen, look at the, at the peripheral aspect of appendix, edema, fatty infiltration, all of those things are important. Let me show you this case as a companion, 68 year old, chronic right lower quadrant pain for a few weeks with sudden onset of acute pain. Now, obviously, starting from the top, this is some lymph node, 12 millimeter, coming down, the cecum is abnormal, all right? But you go further down and you see the appendix. It looked very, very, very thick wall, very dilated, almost two centimeter dilated wall, as you can see that. And then you go further down, there is an air bubble inside it, thick wall, some peri, 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 peri uh, appendiceal uh, node maybe attached, attached here, thickening of the wall again. So all of the features, you can see some edema here. Uh, it's probably a, uh, uncomplicated or close to be uncomplicated appendicitis. But again, as I mentioned to you, appendicitis is a disease of young people. Usually you see it in first, in second and third trimester from 10 to 30, statistically is the year that you see appendicitis. If you start to see in patients over 50 or 60 years old, think about cancer as an underlying cause. Why? Because if you just call it plain appendicitis, the surgeon like to do a laparoscopic and appendectomy nowadays, but they hate to see uh, during laparoscopy that there is a cancer, they have to pull out the endoscope and cut the patient open because they haven't told the patient before going under anesthesia, I will be cutting you open. And that can be a liability, at least over here. So you, when you tell them, I suspect there may be something in the cecum. So you have two choices, either go inside and look or do endoscopy before surgery and look at the cecum if you see some mass there, okay? Because that can be one of the, in fact, somebody reported a, a series of articles, a series of cases in the literature of appendicitis in the older patient and instance of cancer, okay? All right, let's look at this case. Again, you're in the category of neoplasm. 45-year-old history of long-standing hypertension, came with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and then a non-contrast CT was done for the obvious reason. This was done at elsewhere. We, you know, we, when the study is not a good quality, we call it from elsewhere general hospital. That's what we do that, and that's not fair, obviously. But there is the case, followed by uh, a bearing exam. So what we see here is the polycystic disease of the kidney, which could be due to either underlying cystic disease or congenital disease, and there's some calcification. But aside from that, what else we see? We see abnormal duodenum here. And that's probably why a barium study was done to show that duodenum is very prominent falls, narrowing. You can see there is almost like a thumbprint here around that. And, uh, but there's no obstruction. There is no gastric outlet obstruction. There is no duodenal obstruction proximally. So we don't see that here. Now, my question to you is, what's your diagnosis? Okay. What do you need to know? What information do you need to know? And the answer is one of these. Yes to one of them. Three, to, three is no, one is yes. Which one do you need to know? You know if the patient is in an axillary adenopathy or inguinal adenopathy? You need to know if there's a history of surgery, is there a sign of GI bleeding or is there a known malignancy? The answer is only yes, you need to know if there's a history of surgery because the answer is this patient had obviously a transplanted kidney in the right side of the pelvis and therefore the diagnosis is post-transplant lymphoma or what they call it post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Okay, so that's what you, you the, the history is, is the key in the diagnosis. And usually it happened during the first year after transplant. Uh, and as you, many of you know that, and if you know, I can remind you that this is due to Epstein Barr virus, which that plays a very important role in the uh, 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 pathogenesis of this condition. Um, um, 
patients who have gone under transplant, they are more susceptible to this virus, which can be causing uh, uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, various types of lymphoma, obviously, that we don't have to go through uh, different types of lymphoma, okay? Now, this is, this is not my case, this is, this is actually from the literature, and showing the patient with liver transplant has multiple uh, 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 holes in the liver from lymphoma, from transplant multi, uh, uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. Transplant kidney itself can get that, but usually what we see is most of the cases <coughs> in about 33%, uh, uh, you know, about one third of the patient we get GI involvement. Not very often we see adenopathy. So when I question was, you expect to see axillary adenopathy? No, we don't see that in PTL, in patient with uh, uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. They are not necessarily coming with the systemic lymphadenopathy, uh, but rarely you see that here. And that's a GI involvement, which is seen about a third of the patient. Now, this is very interesting because this patient who had had transplant close to a year ago come with uh, uh, shortness of breath, okay? And obviously, if this patient come to your clinic today, you'll say, uh-huh, I got a case of COVID. But this was done way before COVID, I can promise you, okay? This is probably a couple of years old case. And we didn't even know what COVID means. And now we have over half a million people died in the United States just last week, uh, latest in statistics. But anyway, uh, uh, this was biopsy. This was a case of uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder of the lungs. <coughs> when I saw this case, I went through the literature and I found additional cases in the literature, the same feature. You can see with air bronchogram, this patient on the right side, right middle lobe, and this is a second patient with emphysema involved in the left lung, okay? Both of them biopsy proven lymphoproliferative disorder of the lung as a result of transplanted kidneys. Wow, what is that? Well, what everybody can see is splenically. Many of you saw this because the chest x-ray was abnormal. You saw soft tissue around the spine. Some of you saw even soft tissue around the presacral area. You can see again around the spine. So we saw those things here. And when you see those things in a patient who has splenomegaly, obviously splenomegaly was done, was there because the postulation was known to have thalassemia. Patients with thalassemia or any other myeloproliferative disorder or hemoglobinopathies, whatever you want to call that, either due to thalassemia, to uh, thrombocytosis, to even Hodgkin's disease, patients with uh, 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 sickle cell disease, they are prone to develop so-called extramedullary hematopoiesis, okay? And that's exactly what the case is here. And those ex extramedullary hematopoiesis commonplace are around the spine, but it can happen any place. It can happen in the kidneys, it can happen in the liver, it can happen in the spleen, it can happen in the retroperitoneum. There are many, many, it can happen cause bone expansion in the thorax, the ribs can become very abnormal. So many areas can get involved, but the key is the knowledge of the underlying condition that the patients have. And you can make the specific diagnosis by MRI, which I don't, we can discuss that if you want later, but yes, there is a way to make the diagnosis. Of course, sometimes you may have to biopsy that, but MRI is indicated these patients. All right, now that I can see everybody's screen is very much hooked to the screen of your computer. Some of you got the microscope to look at the magnifying glass, look at the film the way we used to, but I'm going to show you bigger images now from the liver. So you don't need to use mag uh, magnifying glass to look at them. Now in the liver, I like to just go back to medical school and talk about tissue in the liver. What tissue is in the liver? We have three types of tissue, hepatocellular tissue, cholangiocellular tissue, and mesenchymal tissue. And those tissue can be the source of a primary neoplasm in the liver, whether benign or malignant. The category of malignancy, I added metastasis because it can go to any place. It has a free ticket, okay? It can go any place it wants, but if you saw a neoplasm, and you know, when we do all kinds of modalities, ultrasound, CT, MR, 
the tissue is not is there. You're trying to get closer and closer and closer to make a proper diagnosis by seeing the pattern of enhancement, by seeing edema, by seeing the size, by seeing calcification, by seeing containing fat or not fat. So we saw all kinds of tricks by our imaging modalities to narrow our differential diagnosis, or even in many cases to make specific diagnosis of these patients. So let's look at that. The most common liver tumor is the hemangioma, okay? And I'm going to start with that. I know it's boring for you because you see tons of hemangioma every day because it's the most common benign liver tumor, most common liver tumor, I should say that, okay? Usually isodense or slightly hypodense or non-contrast CT study. And if you give contrast, I like to emphasize the word, you see non-continuous globular enhancement in the lesion, non-continuous globular enhancement. You can see that here, which gradually fill in by time. This is like a minute after that, that's a, maybe a minute and a half, this is about three to four minutes after that, it's filling in. This is a home run diagnosis. You do not need to do MRI to biopsy, to, to make the diagnosis, neither you need to do the biopsy to, do, to make the diagnosis. If the, if the patient has symptoms, the surgeon is afraid that this is hanging from the edge, he can go and take it out. No, not a big deal. But you are done as far as the diagnosis is concerned. If you do MRI, because the patient cannot get a contrast CT study, for example, these patients usually are diagnosed by ultrasound than for something else, such as gallbladder condition. T1 is dark signal, lobulated. Remember that lobulated appearance of that. And again, non-continuous nodular enhancement in the periphery, which gradually fill in. This is the hallmark for the diagnosis of benign cavernous hemangioma. And I usually mention that in the report, this is consistent with benign cavernous hemangioma and no further diagnostic evaluation is indicated. I put it in the report and my signature below that because some clinicians think that if you do a CT scan, you call it, they have to do MRI to confirm it. No, you don't have to do MRI to confirm that. There are certain conditions you do that. I'll mention that in just a minute. In fact, if you compare the CT scan and MRI, the only advantage of MR is the T2-weighted image give you more hyper-intense lesion in the liver. That's the only advantage. And you saw that here. Here is the T2 that we don't have it in CT scan and give you more hyper-intense lesion in the liver. That's the only advantage. Otherwise, the non-contrast and the contrast has the same pattern of enhancement with centripetal feeling persistent, the same thing that you see in CT scan. And you can see the specificity of these two reaches both of them over 90%, okay? Now, there is the peripheral nodular enhancement, even the lesion is large, what we call it the giant hemangioma when it exceeds five centimeters. Again, peripheral discontinuous nodular enhancement gradually increasing over time. That's the classic for hemangioma with specificity of up to 100%, okay? None of the tumor hepatoma doesn't do that. Cholangiocarcinoma doesn't do that. Adenoma doesn't do that. Uh, focal nodular hyperplasia does, and none of them do that, okay? Now, this is a giant hemangioma, which is almost entirely occupying the right lobe of the liver. We can see there is some central scarring here on the T2 lobulated appearance. And I've emphasized the word lobulation because I have a cyst to compare it to has a very sharp edge, okay? And you can see we give contrast again, this continuous nodular enhancement in the periphery, which gradually fills in. But if you have a lot of central fibrosis, as in this case, which was removed because of its size and location being subcapsular, we could see this uh, uh, central fibrotic tissue in that hemangioma. Now, this is an interesting case because this patient is we call it atypical hemangioma. First of all, when the lesion is giant, it's usually not echogenic, but actually it's hypoechoic, and there is increased through transmission. Generally, we do see increased through transmission in hemangioma. Remember, hemangioma are packed with red, red blood cells. They're really not a sort of uh, 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 hypervascular tumor. And that's why when you do arterial phase, they are not enhancing such as focal nodular hyperplasia, okay? And in this case, we did see a peripheral nodular enhancement discontinuous, but it was hard for the clinician to buy it. He wanted either to biopsy it or do something else. And we recommended, let's do nuclear medicine because that was the time that 
we had only one magnet in that hospital several years ago. Now we have five. Now we can do MR on everybody. But we had one MRI and we had uh, so many patients want to get brain and spine back, okay? And those get prioritized. So we did a nuclear medicine exam and nuclear medicine, which is done by red blood cell tag with technetium, clearly shows hypervascular lesion. Here is an axial image, transverse image, if you will, which is done by spec. And you can see the spleen here, spleen here, liver here, and there is a lesion corresponding with this classic case of cavernous angioma seen in axial, seen in posterior view, seen in sagittal view, coronal view, you name it, you got it. So this is home run, not in the, not, don't need to do any additional examination. Now, speaking about echogenic lesions, you can see this patient has echogenic lesion in the liver, incidentally discovered, and unfortunately, uh, she is, it's a woman, six, 44 years of age. She has allergic to iodine. So we couldn't do it, contrast enhanced CT scan to further characterize this. So with that in mind, and we measured the density of focal areas so look at hypodense. And some of them have densities in around, around fatty density. So you get concerned that, is it really a necrotic tissue? Is it fatty tissue? What's going on? So let's do an MRI. Of course, let's just give you first differential diagnosis of liver lesion with fat containing focal fatty infiltration, HC hepatocellular carcinoma, adenoma, angiomyelitoma, teratoma. Like these are really the tumors in the liver, which I should say probably with order of frequency that I have listed for you, which can cause uh, fat. There are fat in them. Okay. The only thing is. HCC, HCC and adenoma, usually they have a capsule enhancement and also they have high signal intensity on T2 while focal fat doesn't have any of them. Angiolite homo is the mixture and I'll show you some, um, at least one example of that, okay? So this patient went to have an MRI because there was allergic to iodine. And if you notice that on the T2 weighted image, it really doesn't light up. So immediately you know it is not hemangioma. Okay, so, but still could be a focal nodular hyperplasia on this base on the T2 weighted image. Except when you do T1, you can see it is a little bit low signal intensity on the in phase, and you go contrast it hypervascular. Typical feature that you see focal nodular hyperplasia, except you do delay it, focal nodular hyperplasia don't visually wash out like this. If it washes out, you will get concerned about hepatocellular carcinoma or maybe add the normal. One thing I didn't show you is out of phase, which is this one here. There's a tremendous amount of fat inside this. Does it help you? Well, it may. It narrow your differential. You are bouncing around at the normal, but you say, I cannot rule out a well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma because of the washout that you see and the capsule that you see around the lesion, which is enhancing, okay? So you don't really know what it is. At this stage, what you do, you really need to biopsy this case, which was done, and it turned out to be an adenoma, okay? So remember, adenomas and fat-containing hepatocellular carcinoma, sometimes it is not easy to differentiate, but it doesn't matter because both of them have to come out. Adenomas are reported series of being pre-malignant, Rarely they can change the malignancy and they have much higher incidence of bleeding, okay? Usually it's a tumor which is we see predominantly, if not exclusively in women. We used to say on the board exam to the residents that if you call, if you call it a man with adenoma, you're going to flunk your board. It has to be in a woman. Usually those who take contraceptive pills, but we maybe see occasionally in men, but I haven't seen one. What about this? 37-year-old woman, epigastric pain, abnormal ultrasound, and abnormal GFR. So now we are stuck. We cannot use contrast for MR or CT scan because this patient's beam creatinine was also slightly elevated. Okay, so we have dealing with a non-contrast MRI. Here we can see on the T2, it's a little bit dark here. As we know, T2 scan, everything is dark. Every fat is dark, you can see here. So we're concerned about here. On the T1 in phase, and then you do out of phase, very, very dark, a tremendous amount of fat, okay? This is something you can probably sure that this is an abnormal, which is about 50% of the time, there are isolated lesion in the liver. They are single, but it can be multiple too, okay? And here is this patient had 
adenomal joint, about four centimeter, was removed from the segment four of the liver. Okay. Now, angioma lipoma is totally different tumor. It is a benign tumor, but there are cases which are changed to malignancy. It is typically seen in, uh, as an incidental finding, and it can be seen in patients with tuberous sclerosis. We are typically being told that angiomyelipoma of the kidneys are more often to seen in tuberous sclerosis. And that is true because in about 20% of the patient with renal angiomyelipoma is associated with tuberous sclerosis, but only about uh, five to 6% of the liver angiomyelipomas are associated with tuberous sclerosis. So it can be associated with, but look at the tissue component, fat, vascular areas, and then areas of probably muscular. Here you can see the tissue. Vascular is here, muscular is here, and then fat is here. I'm not a pathologist, but I was, my pathologist told me those areas corresponding with artery, muscle, and then fat, okay? So this was removed and obviously it's a very large angiomyelitoma. This patient did not have tuberous sclerosis, by the way. Focal nodular hypoplasia of the liver is some people believe that's probably not a true neoplasm because as the name says, it's a focal lesion, which is nodular and it's associated with hyperplastic portion of the liver, okay? And that's probably, it's benign and usually it's not surgical except if it's giant or causes hemorrhage or uh, uh, it's located in an unusual location or it could be pedunculated, all kinds of things, okay? Here you can see on the T2-weighted image on the haste, heavily T2-weighted image, it's really not bright at all. It's iso dense to the liver or iso intense, I should say, okay? When you do pre-contrast, then you can see that. And there is a central area of scarring, which is dark on T T1 and it's bright on T2. But interestingly, when you go contrast in arterial phase, tremendous enhancement, which immediately disappears. But this is not wash out that you see in hepatoma or in adenoma. We call, we don't call it wash out. This is really become isodense to the hepatic parenchyma and then disappears. But one thing is if you notice that essentially about half of those lesions have central scar and that central scar does become enhanced on delayed field. Let me show you a better case. Here is the large pedunculated focal nodular hyperplasia in the right lobe. But look at the central scar during the venous, during the arterial phase, gradually fills it and completely fills it on delayed phase. This is pathognomonic. You don't see this in hepatoma, you don't see it in hemangioma, you don't see any other tumor, adenoma, you don't see that. This is something you see in focal nodular hyperplasia because this is a central scar that you see in this tumor, which was obviously removed in this case. Now, you may say, well, what is the better way to do it with contrast if you cannot differentiate focal nodular hyperplasia from, um, uh, from adenoma, let's say? Well, there is a contrast in weighted, which call it EOVs, that's what called the United States. I don't know what they call it in Iran or in the Middle East or multi hands but you can see the chemical name of that here. If you give this contrast, the beauty of this contrast is, is excreted both from the kidneys and from the biliary system. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you is that the tissue difference between focal nodular hyperplasia and adenoma is absence of biliary tissue in adenoma and presence of biliary tissue in focal nodular hyperplasia. And that works to the advantage of these people who made this contrast, because when you give it during the arterial phase, you can see that here very hyper intense as you expect to see that in focal nodular hyperplasia. And then gradually it disappears, but look at that on the delayed phase, it reappears. It doesn't really reappear, it retains because the rest of the liver, you can see the blood vessels are cleaned up here. You can see a little bit of contrast actually in the biliary system. You can see that here, this is probably a branch of the bile duct running in the front of the portal vein, which cause the contrast is excreted from that. If you get the gallbladder and the glade image, you can see the gallbladder will opacify actually with, uh, with EOVs. The same thing for multi hands also, except you have to do a little bit longer image to get the nice image of that retained contrast in the focal nodular hyperplasia, just purely because of presence of biliary tissue inside the tumor, okay? Now let's look at another tumor. Here is the in phase and a pulse phase of a lesion in the right lobe, okay? What we see here, there is certainly fat within the tumor on the pulse phase. 
and you do fast skin echo, right? Well, then we so it's a neoplasm. But one thing it's not, you can say immediately this is not hemangioma because hemangioma don't have fat. So really it's going to be between, either it's going to be angioma lipoma, hepatoma with fat, or adenoma with fat. This is not lipoma because lipomas don't enhance. And certainly it's not a teratoma, it's extremely rare and it's usually calcification. So your differential diagnosis is going to be bounced between these two or three, okay? And then look at the contrast was given here, arterial phase, it enhances and it washes out. And you can see on the delayed phase, it's pretty much washed out, except it's heterogeneous inside of that. So at this point, we knew it's probably not adenoma because there are too, many, too much heterogeneity inside it, except when the adenomas bleed inside, they can be heterogeneous with residual hemosiderin and blood product within the lesion. But usually they get bigger when they come to, uh, um, they are more susceptible to bleed when they are larger than this size, okay? So at this stage, we didn't know what it is and we decided to go ahead and biopsy that, which was done, it was really a fat containing hepatic cellular carcinoma, okay? You can see actually an early venous drainage here, which is one of the uh, uh, hallmarks because there's a lot of AV shunting inside this tumor, which give you an early venous drainage. Now, we saw that a few months later, we saw this case. This is an older case, but quality is very, very good. This patient had a dislesion in the right lobe of the liver, which is very vascular, and it washes out. So at this point, it was a man, it wasn't a woman. We thought about fat-containing HCC and not adenoma, really, okay? And uh, we recommended let's do a biopsy, but he said, I have no symptoms. Why bother? Why bother? You don't sell it that, you put that small thing like that. That he didn't want to do anything. So he went home, came back two years later, and there it is. It's got bigger, it's subcapsular now, reaching the hepatic capsule, a lot of fat inside it, and out of phase, arterial enhancement, wash out. We told him, hey, you got to have surgery. We cannot keep this there. This is going to extend into your capsule and come out. By the way, remember, hepatomas, it's been said and it's been proven, actually there is a testament to that is the literature that they all contain some degree of fat on the early stage. And as the tumor grows, the fat disappears. So if you happen to follow a tumor like this for 10 years, you will see this fat will probably disappear in 10 years. It just happened to be there, okay? Because the tumor basically eats up the fat, dominates the fat, the fat spreads all over, so you cannot measure it, you cannot see it that much. So that's something you should know that, okay? So this actually, the patient agreed to have surgery, and this came out and was part of the cellular carcinoma. I'll try to show you as many pathologic, radiologic correlation as I can. And so far, we've been lucky. So this is another patient. Uh, ultrasound shows a, a lesion, echogenic lesion in the liver. A CT T2 doesn't show anything on the T1. Pre-contrast, we do see an area of low attenuation, low intensity in segment 4B, right up next to the false node ligament. But if you notice with contrast injection, the blood vessels <coughs> traverse this area of low intensity without being changed in caliber, the same thing. That's one of the hallmarks of focal fatty infiltration. Here you can see on the outer face, prove that that's fat. This is really a focal fatty infiltration, which one of the hallmarks to that is traversing normal vessels inside it, absolutely normal liver enzymes, absolutely no history of malignancy, but sometimes the patient has history of malignancy and you see that, so be careful. Like in this case, this patient has ovarian carcinoma and we see very abnormal looking liver, okay? But because we see all the vessels traversing nicely through this area, we swear to God that this is all fat. The clinician didn't believe it, he ordered an MRI, which we did luckily because I wanted to make a teaching file and show it to you, okay? So here we can see on the T1 in phase and out of phase and the post contrast, again, the blood vessel traversing, no change in the lumen of the vessels as they go through this. Believe it or not, the clinician didn't believe it. What he wanted now, he wanted biopsy. I said, all right, we'll do it. I got seven fellows who wanted to do biopsies. And we did a biopsy and there it is, diffuse fatty infiltration of the liver 
due to underlying chemotherapy for ovarian cancer whatsoever. There was not one cell of malignant tissue inside the biopsy specimen, okay? Now, this is an interesting case because this is an entity that some of you may or may not be aware of that. I think our surgical colleague, our obstetrician, are more familiar with that. This patient is 32 years young, and she is 10 days after vaginal delivery, developed abdominal pain. I wish I could hear you because many of you are screaming for the diagnosis because you know what it is, okay? But unfortunately, this diagnosis was not made many years ago uh, before the age of CT and ultrasound. And because of that, there was up to 85%, believe me, 85% prenatal mortality for the mother. That's very high. But nowadays, with early diagnosis of this entity, which is called acute fatty liver of pregnancy or AFLP, okay? And these patients may get an early delivery and treated for fatty infiltration. And then nowadays, even with that treatment, still about 80 to 20% of, of the women die because of this entity. Nobody knows what's the pathogenesis and there is no way they can prevent that, okay? So be aware of the patients who are pregnant and they develop this condition. Uh, and you know, one thing I should mention to you that this usually happens in the third trimester of pregnancy with abdominal pain, and sometimes in the first few weeks after normal delivery of the baby, either vaginal delivery or cesarean section, doesn't matter. Now, speaking about fatty liver, I like to basically go through these cases and maybe we can finish up on time. Uh, this patient obviously has fatty liver and the radiologist read this as uh, fatty liver with areas of fat sparing, okay? There is a fat sparing being dark, there is a fatty being bright, so you, nobody blamed him. But this patient has breast cancer. This patient's liver enzyme was abnormal, so nobody buy that, that this is fat sparing in the liver. So because they didn't buy it, they ordered a CAT scan. So we did it, a CAT scan, and we can see here there is diffuse fatty infiltration, the blood vessels are going through that. All of those things which I mentioned to you are in indication of fatty infiltration of the liver, okay? But we have two choices. Either we have to do MRI or we have obtained several biopsies of the liver to make sure, or random biopsies. We chose to do MRI in this patient. Here's the T1 in phase. Out of phase, again, we can see areas of fat sparing, areas of fatty liver all over the liver. And the T2 is the one which raises concern because now we see focal areas of bright signal in the right lobe, okay? So for that, we use contrast and pre-contrast on the top, post-contrast in the bottom. Now we see areas of rim enhancement in the liver, nodular enhancement in the liver, nodular enhancement in the liver, every place. Again, a rim enhancement here. So with that in mind, we offered the surgeon to do all oncologists to do a random biopsy. Uh, and hopefully, because this may be the tip of iceberg, there are many, many of them in the liver. And random biopsy proved this to be metastatic breast carcinoma, okay? Which was essentially missed on ultrasound and CT scan. And that brings you to the idea of when should I do CT? When should I do MRI? The that question comes up almost every day in the clinic, okay? Patient come with diffuse liver metastasis, the surgeon said, do I need to do the MRI? You know, my question is, what is your plan for the patient? If the patient has two lesions in the right lobe, you're going to do right hepatic lobectomy, yes, you need to do MRI, because that's the only way you can make it sure that there's nothing in the left lobe, okay? Or you can do intraoperative ultrasound, which many of you have learned to do, and sometimes they call us to go to the operating room and do it for them. But nevertheless, MR detected more lesion in 27 patients based on this article, comparing all of these patients had CT and MR, by the way, okay? Lesions exclusively seen on MRI in 18% of the time. That is Rich Simalco from North Carolina. No lesion was seen on CT scan that was not seen on MRI. That's a very strong statement, okay? And CT and MR dis disagreed in about 44% of the times. And the information provided by MR had, a had an effect on patient management. Now let's look at some clinical example. Liver metastasis from neuroendocrine tumor. They saw two lesions in the liver on CT scan, contrast in has, and that's not a bad quality exam, all right? They did the MRI, here is a T2-weighted image, and here is a T1 pre-contrast, here is a T1 post-contrast arterial phase, and T1 post-contrast delayed phase. There is clearly 
two lesions and plus there are additional lesions in the liver, one here, one here, maybe another one here. So there are more lesions seen in the liver than you see on the contrast enhanced CT study. Okay, let's look at another patient. Adenoid cystic carcinoma of the submandibular gland. This patient had a CT and MRI. Here's the CT scan shows diffuse fatty infiltration primarily involving liver segment five, six, maybe seven and eight. Segment four is preserved. Segment two and three may be preserved. So what do you do next? Well, because of the liver enzyme being abnormal, an MRI was done. And look at that here on the T1 pre-contrast, T2, T1 arterial, and T1 delayed fade. There is clearly multiple lesions in the liver which could not be clearly identified on the CT scan with contrast, okay? And yes, if you really supervise your CT scan, do what they call a triphasic CT scan, which is three times more radiation, you may be a little bit in the advantage position than just single phase MRI and no radiation at all. So that really brings up to this case, liver tumor evaluation, CT versus MRI. And I show it almost the tumor board conference because that question always comes up. The majority of articles comparing MRI and CT for the liver demonstrate superiority of MRI. It must be done prior to liver surgery for tumor. See the word, it must be done. Also, it must be done if the CT is normal and the liver function tests are abnormal. And then it is indicated in indeterminate liver lesions. And I showed you some quick cases of indeterminate lesion. For example, the patient couldn't have a CT scan and because of allergic to iodine, we did MRI, okay? Uh, or other imaging exam, whatever they're going to do. So there are indications, absolute indication, and there are relative indications to the MRI, okay? But generally in any place that they do liver surgery, they do that liver MRI prior to liver surgery for tumor removal. <laughs> Let's move to the <clears throat> last liver case that I have for you. Here's the patient which is 65 years old and has abdominal pain and abnormal liver function tests. Here you can see there's a very large lesion in the right lobe of the liver, extended to the left lobe, there is some biliary dilatation. There is subcapsular extension of the tumor or beyond the capsule, I should say that here, you can see it better here on the post contrast. And then there's capsular retraction. Here's the arterial phase with contrast. Here is the delayed phase, which is about maybe a minute after this, because we are still in the early or early arterial phase, I should say late arterial or early portal venous phase, because when you start to see hepatic veins, you call it really portal venous phase or hepatic phase, okay? Uh, the question I have here, what would you do next? You repeat the CT study and recommend, uh, rep I'm sorry, report the CT study and recommend ERCP. You prepare for CT guided biopsy. You obtain further delay CT or you report CT study and recommend pecophanius transhepatic cholangiogram. Which one? I think many of you paid attention to what I emphasized and that was arterial phase and early venous phase or later arterial phase see more enhancement of the tissue than that, okay? And that is one of the hallmarks of the diagnosis because the answer to that question, which I just proposed you is obtain further delay CT scan because as I showed you on the further delay CT scan here, this lesion is filling in, okay? These are the three images I showed it to you. But when you go back and tell the, this is almost excretory phase because the contrast is coming out of the kidneys, okay? What we call a pre-contrast, corticomedullary phase, nephrographic phase, and pyelographic phase. And you need that pyelographic phase to see the same way the contrast out of the kidney, the same way contrast oozes inside. So why this happens? This is one of the hallmarks of this particular thin tumor, which you already know the answer, cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, because the cholangiocarcinomas do have, uh, the, it's the most common tumor that often has dense fibrous stroma inside it within the liver. You know, we are taught that the hemangioma is pool in contrast, but hemangioma give you peripheral nodular enhancement, which is discontinuous. Hemangioma doesn't give you capsular retraction. Cholangiocarcinoma does. So remember, the, the, it's, it's the, the, the delayed image is the key to make the diagnosis in this, uh, in this entity. Okay, now in the differential diagnosis, I, I mentioned 
Could this be a case? By the way, we forgot to go through the differential diagnosis. All of these things that I mentioned to you are out basically because they don't, they just don't match. Fibrolomeral hepatic carcinoma cell carcinoma, I like to show it to you because this tumor has lobulation appearance, central calcification. It happens in the liver, which is otherwise normal. The patient does not have hepatitis, the patient does not have cirrhosis, the patient is not alcoholic, and usually happens in younger patients and usually is curable by surgery. Alpha fetoprotein could be normal in this patient, which is not normal in hepatocellular carcinoma. So fibrolomelon is totally different animal than the other type of hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's rarely multicentric, while the hepatocellular carcinoma can be often multicentric. This is another case of cholangiocarcinoma. Look at the peripheral thick enhancement, not discontinuous, even though it fills in the contrast. This is not hemangioma. This happened to be the patient who has PSC, which is primary, which is uh, sclerogic cholangitis, basically, primary sclerogic cholangitis has developed cholangiocarcinoma, which is one of the complications of PSC, which by itself happens in patients with underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Now, then to propose this question as a last question from my liver talk, is the MRI is to be considered over CT in the diagnosis of hepatic adenoma for hepatocellular carcinoma, focal nodular hyperplasia from adenoma, cavernous hemangioma or cholangiocarcinoma. Which one of them is correct? Anyone? The answer is B because that's the only one you can make the differentiation by using a proper contrast, which is EOVs and differentiate focal nodular hyperplasia from adenoma. You need MRI over CT scan, but you don't need MRI over CT scan for hepatic adenoma from HCC because both of them show fat, okay? The, true that the MRI can have in phase and a pulse phase can help you, but it's not really absolutely necessary if you can use contrast, except if you don't use contrast, that's a different story. Cavernous hemangioma, obstacle, dark cholangiocarcinoma. No, you don't need that really for diagnosis of that. CT can do the job. Okay. This case, I'm going to show you a couple of cases of pancreas because we are pretty much running out of time. And I apologize for my colleagues in Michigan because they are staying now. It's close to two o'clock in the morning. And they stay, they told me that they will stay to look at every case that I'm going to be showing that. So my apology to them. But anyway, which of the following is not included in the differential diagnosis of this finding here? Small areas of low attenuation in the pancreas. You can see that in the head, in the body. Is it pancreatic metastasis? Is it multiple neuroendocrine tumor or multiple IPNN? Introductal papillary muscle producing neoplasm. Is this pancreatic lymphoma? or it's multiple cystadenoma, which one of them is not in the differential diagnosis. I can tell you metastasis is, I can tell you multiple neuroendocrine tumor is because they can be hypovascular, often they are hyper. I can tell you IPNN is because they can be multiple hypo-intense or hypo-dense on CT. I can tell you it can be multiple lymphoma, multicentric is. But the one is not, it's cystadenoma because cystadenoma, first of all, it's in women, this is a man. Second, it is usually the disease of older patients such as mucinocystadenoma, which is called mother tumor and serocystadenoma, which is called grandmother tumor. They are usually single, occasional uh, multiple, but they rarely, uh, they, they are usually pre-malignant if they are seen in mother, the type of so-called mucinocystadenoma but this is not the case. So this is the only one which is not in the differential diagnosis. The other three are. Let me show you some examples of neuroendocrine tumor, multiple hypervascular lesions in the pancreas. You know, when I used to work at the Anderson, we used to go to the operating room with a transducer on the pancreas. You had a surgeon who used to do all of this. They had a few cases a month referred from all over the world. And we put a transducer, we didn't have MRI. We didn't know that arterial phase CT scan, the CT was that sophisticated those days who give you, you know, sub millimeter size thickness. So we used to go to the operating room and show this other transducer sitting on the pancreas and find every piece of the pancreas if there was tumor, okay? And this is a case of uh, actually neuroendocrine tumor, which is hypovascular, okay? You can see it came out. And this is the case of multiple metastasis to the pancreas 
due to renal carcinoma, which has been removed. This patient, obviously, the renal carcinoma is gone, and there are multiple bit static hypervascular tumor in the pancreas, at least half a dozen of them on this image. So in fact, pancreas is one of the favorite places for uh, metastatic renal carcinoma to go. Someone reported a series from, uh, uh, from Mayo Clinic about uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago uh, from uh, such a neoplasm, uh, renal carcinoma with pancreatic metastasis. So you can go and look at it. Kate Klein actually was her name, the one who reported that, I remember that. So this patient actually had a PET scan and PET scan shows multiple, this is the, the chest x ray abnormal, soft tissue pericardiac area here, and there was increased uptake in this multicentric lymphoma of the pancreas, okay? B-cell lymphoma. Lymphoma can be primary in the pancreas, multicentric lymphoma of the pancreas, very large, bulky pancreas, okay? All right, I'm going to finish up these two cases as, as the last one, and I have time to show one GU case because I cannot go away without, Dr. Rodman would not let me take off the hook without one GU case, I can tell you that. All right. there are, these are tiny vessels all over. Look at that here. You just saw tiny things in the pancreas, but these are really uh, abnormal uh, vessels in the pancreas. In a patient who has a funny celiac axis, look at the celiac axis. If you do coronal reconstruction or sideshow reconstruction, you can see it looked like somebody cut off the origin of the celiac axis, but it's really narrow. Uh, this is due to what? Due to compression by median arcuate ligament. So these are these vessels, these little tiny vessels are all arteries. Why? Because somebody has to supply the blood to where the cilia cannot, and that's going to be this guy here, the supermesontic artery has to supply blood. And that's basically what happens in patient with media. I got this from the, uh, from the literature. This is about 1% of the time, but about uh, 25 to 30% of them are it's seen every day on your practice if you pay attention, but only about 1% become symptomatic and develop into the so-called median arcuate ligament syndrome, okay? But this syndrome usually due to compression of the superior mesentric, of the celiac axis by the median artery ligament and the arcuate ligament basically, which is becomes more compressed during expiration. So if you're doing Doppler study on the patient, make sure to have the patient take a deep breath and severely blow it out and look at this artery. If you have a good sonographer or your patient is as skinny as it should be, not some of the patient that I used to see in Michigan, which are about you know, 80, 90, 100 kilograms. No, they're not, those are not good ultrasound. So you can see those things here compressing and sometimes the nerve adjacent to the aorta get compressed. So pain, nausea, and vomiting. So for many years, they, really, they didn't know what causes that. Many of these patients were treated with uh, uh, you know, irritable bowel syndrome because the patient had a lot of pain. Here you can see the celiac axis is obliterated. Look at the square mesonic artery. Look at extensive collaterals from the gastroduodenal arcade and pancreatoduodenal arcade supplying the pancreas which is sitting right inside the duodenum. So all of those dots that you see are from here. Okay, here's an angiogram showing the nice one. How can this patient get treated by surgeon or by radiologist? Radiologist put a stand here, surgeon go ahead and maybe do a arterioplasty. They remove this piece and hook this to the aorta. So there are many ways to, to skin the cat if you will. This is actually a companion case, except these small little things are veins, because this patient who happened to have the, so the portal vein thrombosis, as seen here in this uh, uh, drawing or this picture, has developed tremendous collaterals around the portal vein, so called pancreatic portal cavernoma, nicely written in the Journal of Pancreas. Uh, in, uh, and I borrowed that from the literature, this is not my case. But nevertheless, it's a companion case to my case, which shows both artery on the previous case and vein can see multiple dots in and around the pancreas due to lack of venous return to the liver from portal vein thrombosis or the other one due to lack of arterial supply from celiac axis, which is all the blood comes from collaterals through the, through the uh, super mesotic artery. So six category is a, challenging GU cases, but I'm going to show one case and that's it. This is my last case, okay? Because I don't really have time to show GU cases and I love to do that. Maybe the next time 
If they get called me back, I'll concentrate on GU. This is a new patient. This came to us about, about three, four months ago. I think it was sometimes in the fall that the patient came because his scrotum was getting bigger, okay? Now, we need immediate an ultrasound. Obviously, you can see the Doppler shows classic varicose cell. No brainer, everybody can make the diagnosis. But the take home point for this case is, remember the veins which drains the testicle, so-called testicular vein, they have no valves in it. As a result of lack of any valve, if something up here obstructs this vein, the blood come back to the testicle in the form of varicose cell. This happened to be here on the right side. This patient has stage four renal carcinoma, infiltrating into the gonadal vein without valve to all the blood come back here and present like this. And that's why this patient testicle was getting bigger, but this patient had episodes of hematuria. He didn't pay attention to that. He said, it's, I'm supposed to have it. He thought he's drinking some, maybe some type of uh, pomegranate juice. Or somebody asked me in the clinic, if I drink pomegranate juice, do I develop my uh, urine get red? And I said, no, they shouldn't, okay? So anyway, some patients don't pay attention. So this was actually a take home point for this case of renal carcinoma involvement of the IVC. You can see the tumor within the IVC. The tumor is within the IVC here and obstruction of the gonadal vein resulting in extensive varicose cell, okay? So with that in mind, I'm going to stop at this point and thank you very much for your patience and staying so late. I want to be the first one to congratulate everyone for the 1400 the, our no rules, which is coming up in just three weeks. I'm very excited. We always celebrate this, our half scene table from last year with the gifts for the children and family. So you're always welcome here and join us during no rules. Thank you again. And this is the uh, tallest building in, in, in my hometown where I was born and raised until I was 18, the wonderful city of Yaz. I don't know if anybody from Yaz is watching this, uh, this presentation. If you are, my greetings to you, and I hope I'll be seeing you soon. Thank you, Dr. Rodman. And thank you very much, Professor Shihoda. Well done, excellent presentation. I, I always love your cases. They, they were really interesting. So uh, just, we can maybe, we can have some uh, few, few questions from the audience. If we can, uh, Ms. Sadegui, please uh, open the chat for the audience. Is there maybe any- Everybody went to lunch. <laughs> Not yet, yeah, because, but there it's, it's midnight at, uh, at, at, at uh, Yeah, it's four minutes to 12 o'clock, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we have a oh, question. I, I from don't think you're going to see one o'clock anyway. Uh, yeah, one question uh, from Dr. Horban uh, Isani. What about use of DWI to differentiate between HCC and adenoma? Well, DWI is, yeah, we have used that. I think in phase and a post phase is probably better than DWI because the goal is really detecting fat. Yes, DWI will show you the stricter diffusion in hepatoma and you will not see that in adenoma necessarily. Uh, but I have seen some cases with pitfalls where especially the, uh, the, uh, 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 the ADC map will show you some restricted diffusion you will be concerned. It's not as bright as you see in hemangioma, for example. But yes, we do see that if you do use DWI in hemangioma, which I didn't show you to, maybe I should have shown it to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and many, many notes of thanks and appreciation to you. That uh, one more question from, again, Professor Ekmetnia. Could we differentiate bowel endometrioma and lymphoma? That's a very, I mean, yes. tough question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Please. I think one thing I should mention that remember, endometrioma as well as as well as uh, extramedullary hematopoiesis or tissues which they con contain hemosiderin or blood product. And whenever you have a tissue which has hemosiderin or blood product, MRI can be very helpful, especially when you do T2 star or in phase and a post phase. It's like you do hemosiderosis of the liver. You get a very dark liver, for example, when you do T2 star for make the diagnosis of the hemosiderosis of the liver. So the same thing is for extramedullary hematopoiesis and the same thing for, uh, for uh, uh, endometrioma, endometriosis, because endometriosis, as you know, it contains blood product. It's a tissue, but it can become cystic. 
And on ultrasound, we see like a chocolate milk inside it, very fine echoes if it becomes hemorrhage within the tissue. But yes, MRI is very helpful to differentiate the two from each other, yes. But and lymphoma is not that much. But aside from that, usually lymphoma is much more metabolically active than, than, uh, uh, than uh, uh, endometrioma. For if, if you decide to do PET plus the fact, usually PET scan is done because the question is not only the diagnosis, is also staging. Okay, thank you. And uh, one question from one uh, unknown participant. Can you, could you please explain how did you reach diagnosis of carcinoid tumor of appendix in your case? Uh, I think you, you mentioned uh, that was pathology. There was a diagnosis. It was called appendicitis. The patient had surgery and pathologists made the diagnosis. But I mentioned to you, if you are concerned, get a delayed scan because the central portion, if you did contrast enhanced study, which is generally done, will enhance, will go away. Well, if you do pre and post contrast, it will definitely, in fact, I have a case of, I have two cases of carcinoid, which they did pre and post contrast, shows clearly there is enhancement of the lumen, not just the wall, because remember, simple appendicitis give you enhancement of the wall, but carcinoid in the lumen give you enhancement of the lumen. And yet, in that's when the entire appendix is filled with carcinoid tumor, but generally it's not the case. Usually the orifice of the appendix get filled with, uh, uh, get obstructed and the patients would present with appendicitis, which make the diagnosis more complicated if you don't recognize that tissue at the origin of the appendix. Okay, thank you. And one, uh, only one maybe more question from Dr. Mislami. Uh, she has some concerns to make the diagnosis of multifocal atypical hemangiomas, I think. And he, she's asking, is there any concern about misdiagnosis when we think about, uh, I think, well, yeah. I mentioned to you again about atypical. It doesn't matter if it's a single or multiple, but generally the one which is giant this chance of being more atypical is much more than being a small one. But I have seen small hemangiomas which are atypical, and those cases either go to nuclear medicine because nuclear medicine, especially with a tagged red blood cell, is going to be always supportive for the diagnosis if that's a hemangioma. Okay, but remember, hemangioma is not a holy tumor not to touch. I have biopsy a dozen of hemangiomas, okay? The only thing you have to be concerned is do not go directly to the tumor from the liver capsule when the tumor is subcapsular. Try to use as much liver tissue, normal liver tissue to traverse your needle to reach the hemangioma if you must biopsy, okay? So people think, and some clinicians think, hemangioma, you don't touch it. No, you can biopsy it. Because if you go for four centimeter through the liver or six centimeter through the liver and reach the lesion and then get a core, you're not, you're not going to cause any problem. I usually use a little gel form and put in my track before pulling my, my, my stylet out, but that's okay. It doesn't really cause any problem, but it's safer to use a little uh, uh, gel form in your stylet and, and block the, the track that you put the needle through the liver. And that's the only place you can bleed. But if you go straight through that from the liver capsule with the tumor is subcapsular, you're asking for trouble. Okay, thank you, thank you. Very nice points, uh, uh, interventional point in the, of this session, because well, we, we have all, well, 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 all, yeah, <laughs> all intervention and uh, CT and okay. all guided intervention. We started to actually a more guided intervention, especially for prostate, uh, really? which are done it now in many places, yeah. Great, great. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we, we don't have enough time and I, we should close the session. So once again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all three speakers, Professor Tehran Sadeh, Professor Mafi, that I think he stayed with us uh, up to the end, and uh, Professor Shihoda for these excellent uh, lectures and their great job. I hope, I hope we can have you here in a face-to-face -face meeting in Iran. And uh, thank you again. Uh, and uh, my very special thanks to Dr. Martin Yagmoy, who is the head of the desk uh, for international cooperation between Iran and North America at, at GMS for her kind support and assistance. Uh, I'm really grateful for uh, IT colleagues, Ms. Sadeghi and Ms. Alaedini, 
who spent a lot of time uh, to organize and manage this uh, session. My warm regards and thanks to Dr. Cordy, the Vice Dean of uh, International Affairs of TOMS, and Dr. Nekufar, Director of International Relations of uh, TOMS. And uh, just uh, uh, one point for the participants that the certificates will be sent to them by email uh, if they had registered in the website of the program. And, uh, and they mentioned the correct name in, their, in this uh, I mean, session. And uh, this presentation will be recorded and will be available on the website of the, uh, the, the this, our website, uh, just uh, upon the, getting the permission from all three speakers, because some of the Professor Moffi's cases uh, were uh, under publish and should we should he should get permission from the publisher and uh, after that we can uh, upload the whole program on the website okay uh, thank you by this i would like to thank from all the participants for attending this this webinar and i hope we can continue this kind of educational program abroad for the i mean uh, near future Thanks again, and uh, thanks uh, to you, Dr. Rodman, for a wonderful you. job you have done with your colleagues, especially with uh, Dr. Yarmo. He was very helpful uh, the yes. last time that we went through two nights ago, and today Thank too. You. Obviously, I think uh, you opened the door now that you know when I approached some of my colleagues here, I told them you know the, the problem is uh, it's you know an RSNA in the United States. People have gone on the Zoom. I mean the same path many countries around the globe are taking you're not the first one um, you know i've been talking to a couple of other places such as guatemala brazil they are using the same thing in, in western hemisphere so uh, they are really uh, active in uh, taking advantage of this modality and this approach because it doesn't cost them a lot to have the speaker doing all the way there it takes less time and has the same benefit obviously practically has the same benefit I think many of the future conventions are going to be in the form of webinar. I wouldn't be surprised that continue even after uh, COVID is completely eradicated. We will continue to use a web page, uh, at least for baby smaller meeting. You can say that there is nothing can replace human interaction. True, that is true. But then we are dealing with the cost saving in the world that the economy is dominating every other issue. So I think with your help, with my colleagues here, those in Iran, I think we can hopefully continue this trend. And I'm sure the residents and the, uh, the younger the physician would be the beneficiaries of this approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much. I, I really need your help to extend this kind of collaboration for the future. I mean, this kind of virtual education. You and, uh, okay, thank you. It's always on for you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again. This is the end of this session. So have a nice time everywhere. Have a nice day or nice. Thank you. All bye around bye. the world. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.